and welcome to episode 22 of the Crash and Ride podcast. I'm Patrick Ferguson. I'm your host. Today's guest is Bill Maloney, founder of the Vigilantes of Love, guitar player, singer, songwriter, formerly based out of Athens, Georgia, now outside of Taos, New Mexico. Bill and I have known each other 25 or maybe almost 30 years now. Um, we've played some music together. I've been on a couple of his records. I've stayed in touch with him through the years, and I felt like he'd be a great guest for the podcast, so I hope you enjoy our interview. If you're not familiar with the program, Crash and Ride is a long-form interview podcast where I talk to musicians who've survived anxiety, depression, addiction, and abuse. As Bill and I discussed in the podcast, the average working musician's approach to health care is, I hope this goes away, and tea tree oil. And that includes mental health care, and many, many of us have spent time on buses, in tour vans, sitting on our own couches thinking, I hope this goes away. The sort of founding principle of the Crash and Ride podcast is I, I just wanted to start having honest and open conversations amongst musicians who've suffered from anxiety, depression, and addiction about what it was like and how we got through it and what our lives are like now. The idea was that if we could see ourselves in the struggles of other musicians, then we could find out ways to help ourselves and help each other. So far, I'm really pleased with how, how the podcast is going. Um, I'm a working musician. If you're familiar with the program, you know that I play with the high-energy rock band uh, that came here from Tokyo, Japan without a drummer. They're called Pinky Doodle Poodle. Uh, their visa runs out next week, and they're leaving the country. I'm super sad about that. And there's a GoFundMe up. Uh, you can find them on any number of social media pages, but I'd recommend you know starting with Facebook. Click through to their GoFundMe if you want to help us pay for their visa renewal application process and get them back here before the end of 2019. Uh, I also play with Mike Mills uh, from REM and his side project, the Mike Mills Orchestral um, Project called the Concerto Band. Uh, we're doing a tour with Chuck Lavelle from the Rolling Stones. That tour starts in late September and runs through mid-October. I'll post dates on the uh, soon-to-be-opened Crash and Ride podcast website and also on our Patreon page. So if you want to come see that show, you can come check it out. The Patreon page is www.patreon.com slash crash and ride. Um, also, if you want to email the program, it's crash and ride at protonmail.com. Very soon, there's going to be an actual website for the podcast. I'll give you that URL as soon as that goes up. There will also be a web store where you can buy the Crash and Ride Espresso that Jittery Joe's roast for us. You can buy Crash and Ride t-shirts that say Loud Guitars Save Lives there. There's probably going to be some Pinky Doodle Poodle merchandise that they have to leave behind when they go back to Japan. So if you weren't able to pick up one of their shirts at the shows, you can get one from me. And that should be up in like two weeks. Here's a couple of quick announcements. Crash and Ride is brought to you in part by Greer Amplification. Greer Amp spills the best boutique effects pedals available. If you're looking for an overdrive, boost, fuzz, compressor, or tremolo that is rugged, road tested, and at home on stage, in the studio, or in your living room, Greer has a pedal for you. Nick and his staff strive to build the best products around with the best tone you've ever heard. They believe in their products and they stand behind them too, backing each one up with a lifetime warranty to the original owner. Each Greer Amps product is hand-built in Athens, Georgia, USA. Go to www.greeramps.com or visit your favorite music retailer today. Brash and Ride is also brought to you in part by Jittery Joe's, a local coffee roaster based in Athens, Georgia. They've created a special espresso blend named after the podcast. That's right, it's called Crash and Ride. It will soon be available on their web store. It'll be available on the Crash and Ride web store. It'll be available for sale in cans at Hendershot's Coffee here in Athens, Georgia. Speaking of Hendershot's Coffee... That is where we're going to do our live show, either in mid-September or mid-October. We're going to do a live taping of an episode there. I'm going to interview Bob Sleppy, the director of Nucci Space, which is the life-saving mental health nonprofit based here in Athens, Georgia, that has saved so many lives. We talk about it in this episode. I've talked about it in several other episodes. Nucci Space is a wonderful organization. I'm really looking forward to talking to Bob. In addition to Nucci Space, there are at least two other mental health nonprofits I'm an avid supporter of. One is the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. If you're having dark thoughts, if you're contemplating self-harm, if you need somebody to talk to, the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline is 24-7. It's free. It's confidential. It's staffed by trained volunteers. 1-800-273-8255. That's the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. 1-800-273-8255. If you're a trans person and you're experiencing depression, anxiety, or dysphoria and you need to talk to a peer, the Trans Lifelines Peer Support Line is 1-877-565-8860. That's 1-877-565-8860. If you listen to the intro of last week's episode, you know that I was at Carolina Beach, which was the beach I used to go to when I was a little boy uh, with my family, and it was kind of melancholy being there because so many of my family have passed on now. And um, 
I'm home now, and I had this great conversation with Bill, but also that conversation is peppered with references to, to people who are no longer with us, Newt Carter, Jeff Walls, uh, Vic Chestnut, like the whole handful of people who, who you know, just passed on, some some at their own hands, some from health crises. It, it's, um, it's kind of an interesting conversation. Bill and I have known each other for so long, we're both kind of getting older, and it, it's, it's, I guess this is just what happens, especially when so many of your peers don't have any health care at all. So um, I, I called Bill on his landline because his cell service where he lives isn't sufficient to have a long conversation. And I was here at my desk and uh, just outside of Athens, Georgia. And it was good to catch up. It was there's a whole swirl of events around it, too. You know, I'm playing my last shows with Pinky Doodle Poodle before they leave the country. And, and Jake Kreger was in town this weekend, who's my first podcast interview. Like episode one is Jake Kreger. And he and I ran around and. I mean, I guess anybody who's listened to this podcast is probably aware that, like, depression, anxiety, all that, it, there's a lot of negative feelings, but sometimes even, like, a lot of positive feelings can be overwhelming, and, and it, it's, been a, it's been a couple of days. Um, it's good to have people that you can, like, catch up with and blow off steam with, like, having Jake here was great, but, you know, some of our peers who are suffering... Um, they're not in a place where they feel comfortable reaching out. So if you've got a friend, a musician who is withdrawing and you feel like maybe could use a little help, reach out, give them a shout, check on them, make sure everything's okay. Um, it can't hurt. Um, well, I guess with that in mind, let's jump into our conversation with Bill Maloney. I'm here with Bill Maloney, founder of the Vigilantes of Love, singer-songwriter, formerly based out of Athens, Georgia, now somewhere in the wilds of New Mexico. Where are you living now, Bill? Pretty close to Taos. That's sort of in the uh, the northern end of uh, of New Mexico. So it, it was an artist community that kind of had a... It's always there, like back in the 20s and 30s, you had people like... Uh, well, just all sorts of folks, you know, out there that were kind of like, you know, doing art, doing visuals because they were falling in love with the Western landscape. So it was uh, it's kind of it hit another heyday in the 70s, I think, when the, the counterculture hippie thing kind of took off. And uh -huh. New Mexico is an interesting state. It, it's full of cultural, you know, beautiful cultural prompts in a lot of ways. But it's a poor state, too. Uh, the uh, the boom of the of modernity never hit here really so you find a uh, actually Mariah and I are it's it's kind of nice we're a minority out here obviously the Latino population which is you know beautiful people big hearts deep deep knit families uh, we didn't know that when we landed out here after a tour uh, back about ten years ago. Uh, but we just Craigslisted a house and um, and found a house in Santa Fe. That's where we live first. Uh -huh. And of course, you're dealing with you know uh, homes that have been around for 150 some 200 years. They're made out of adobe, uh -huh. and uh, great sound acoustics. By the way, my studio is about 150, 175 years old, and uh, it's two foot thick walls of mud and straw. Uh, just elegant. It's everything that you think, everything that you might have ever seen, you know, growing up with a, you know, with an old western, you know, whether it was you know a um, you know, the the Rifleman or, you know, a John Wayne movie. It's like all the best stuff, you know, Cowboy Kitchen all just put right, right in, in place. So it was hard not to want to be there because, I mean, I'm a son of the South. I grew up there, been there 45 years, 35 in Athens. So uh, we, we made the move, and, you know, like I said, you just take the, the bitter with the sweet. How long have you been out there now? Ten years, coming up on ten years. And when you said that that community had a, a heyday earlier, I immediately assume you meant the 60s and 70s, and then you said it had a resurgence in the 60s and 70s. So when was that original hate? Dorothy, was yeah, Dorothea Lyon. People like Dorothea Lyon came out. Uh, a guy named Maynard Dixon. If, if you look, Maynard Dixon, yeah, and George yeah. O'Keefe was just down the road from us in uh, Abiquiu. That's where she... Uh, that's where she wound up. So, uh -huh. yeah, all these artists back east were coming out to paint, you know, this vivid light. And that's the thing that attracts a lot of visual artists is the vivid light. Um, of course, you've got the uh, the Native American artisans that are still going strong. I mean, their metal work, their work, uh, obviously, with turquoise, you know, the mines are still open. It's beautiful. So I, I loved it because it did feel like a people. It, it wasn't scene-oriented, if you can kind of, you know, take that in the right direction. It was It was people just, you know, doing what they've done for a long long time and so we were immersed in it and uh and like i said as, as a you know quote as a minority we just you know stood on the sidelines and cheered that's what you do you know it's like wow that's amazing you know we love it so we've acquired a a little bit of art here and there and 
and uh, you know some nice jewelry and things like that when we were able to afford it because right. that's supporting the local artists that's basket weaving all of that it's just incredible mm-hmm. the pottery out here is just it's it really is incredible so you still find people you know from the east you know the mega centers like the atlantas and the new yorks and right. you know further west la they still make the trek into you know taos and santa fe to uh, to discover the stuff did you ever read the milagro beanfield war I saw the movie. I never read the book. Yeah, the book was great. I highly recommend the book. I th- didn't it happen somewhere outside of Taos? Is that correct? Or my yeah, it did. It it happened about fifteen miles up the road in a little town called Truchas. That book made a huge, huge impact on me. I the I think the book, the movie is good, and I and I understand Robert Redford's impulse in making that film, but man, the book is really amazing. I'll take you up on it. I got. Her, I, I need a new uh, a new project to read. That'd be great. It's been great coming out of this project. I, I, I that's what I usually do to kind of decompress after recording. You know, right. intensely for months. It's I, I start reading again. And you're you're working on a record right now. I'm working on a double CD. It started out. We we kickstarted the thing last year, and um, and it, it's a, a double CD. It's going to be a, somewhere between 25 and 30 songs. I started out with a set list of about 50, but I just couldn't get them all done, and uh, so I, I kind of you know. I had some medical issues last year that uh, that needed some attending to. Some of it was emergency, so that kind of cut the project in half, and it, it's ended up dragging on almost a year now. So, what what was uh what was the medical thing? Or did man, you it was stuff that got started, you know, way back in the day, D- dude stuff, you know, I, I, and it needed attending to. There were some emergency situations, and it got. I mean, we can we can go off here, but I, I don't I don't really want to. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I don't, I don't want to make it super super public, but I will say this: I, it needed it needed out of state attention, and it was like the stars aligned with the right people in the right places. It ended up going to Tucson, having the surgery. It was wildly successful. Oh, good. I feel like I got 17 years of my life back, and, and that's no joke. I'm not exaggerating in the least, but it was a issue that just had not been dealt with uh, ever since you know first diagnosed back in Athens, Georgia. I don't think people understand what it means when you say music, musicians health care. Like, most of it is, I hope this goes away, and tea tree oil. Absolutely, uh, yeah. I mean, your your brother had to deal with that same thing. Yeah, he he nearly died from a heart attack. Now almost. I know two years he's ago. he's a genius musician and a singer. I mean, you are as well. I mean, I don't know, just something in, in the water you guys were drinking when you grew up. But when his <laughs> post, you know, Facebook came across about what was going on, I thought, I bet he does not have a lick of insurance Nothing. or a safety net around him. Nope. Uh, the Obamacare thing so. uh, assumes that you have a certain level of income, and then of course our governor. Uh, in the interest of protecting free enterprise, uh, block Medicaid expansion uh, for the the super um, poor, uh, like a lot of musicians that I know. And so people just cowboy it and hope for the best. Yeah, I know. I think West Delk has had some things recently that have gone on. You know, I, I, I try to keep up with some of the folks. I and mean, then, you know, God bless and rest in peace, Jeff Walls. I mean, good gracious. Yeah, that was you know, so, so unexpected and, and so tragic. Oh, he he was a genius, and what an encourager he was. I mean, if his gift was, you know, he had lots of gifts, including just being a brash, kick-ass guitar player, but good Lord, he was such an encourager. Yeah, he was great. I miss him. I mean, I, I just, you know, it's, it's, it's funny. I mean, we're not young anymore. I, I'm not young. No. I just turned 64 in January of this year, and, you know, I got started late in the game. I didn't even start playing guitar. I wasn't even playing guitar. I, I started taking my early chord books when I was 31 years old. Um and I, I played drums around Athens bands for a while, but nothing was really going up the nothing was really, you know, clicking. I've been racking my brain all day trying to remember the name of that band from before when you were playing drums that had was that was the word Rose in the name? What was that band? There was a there was a band that I played in that I played guitar in called Bed of Roses. But that was the band it. that I played drums in in the early days was was a band called Matching Fibers. Mm-hmm. And that was kind of a, it had a kind of a, a raw, you know, actually it was a little bit in some ways like the band Morphine. It had that kind of feel to it, a little dark. And then we had a sax player named Mike Jones who was who just incredibly well know versed Mike. jazz player. All right, there you go. Yeah, I play jazz with Mike. Oh, great, yeah. I mean, he was listening to all the right guys, you know, Sonny Rollins, you know, all the people. He, was, he, was, he, he actually opened up my doors because I was raised as a jazz drummer. My dad was a bit of a jazz drummer, so, you know, he... He was trying to get me to solo in five, four time like Joe Morello. That's the kind of music I grew up with. And when I met Mike Jones, I thought, man, we're going to have fun in this band. So, um, Is any of that music available still? I I think there's a 45 floating around out there. I think maybe Dan over at Wuxtree probably has, you know, 
the last five copies of it or something like that. But I, I don't I don't really know. I, I should probably you know burn that something and put it out. It was a lot of fun. I overplayed on every damn thing. I mean, every fill was far too much. I mean, you know, there's a time and a place for it. You know. Yeah. Well. I don't know. I was. I, it was more like you know Keith Moon meets Morphine. It was way too flipping much. And I go back and listen to it now, and I just think I, I can't even make it through the end of the song. Oh, we man. had fun. It, it was a post-punk thing. Mark Cherry was on guitar. I think he's still in the neighborhood more or less. And mm-hmm. you know he was playing great cool stuff. Chuck Connolly, who I think worked at Wax Tree, was playing real doomy kind of bass. You know, and uh, right. he was a big fan of the Buzzcocks and that kind of thing. So we just all got together. It was some kind of strange alchemy. And you know how it is with bands. It either works or it doesn't. But you know we. We made a dent, and I was I was proud of what we were doing. So, where did you grow up? Where, where, how did I grew you... up in Chapel Chapel Hill, North Carolina. You and James Taylor. Yeah, yeah. James <laughs> is a local boy that made good. Yeah. And uh, Ben Ben Folds is up that way. Yeah, he's fantastic. I think he's in Nashville now, but he's definitely from that area. I'm not. I'm from yeah. not far from there. Were you, were you born in Chapel Hill? No, I was born in a little town called Martinsville, Virginia, just north of the Carolina border. Man, I'm from Eden, North Carolina, which is what 15 right. minutes from Martinsville. <laughs> <laughs> there, there you go. I had I no idea. It, I didn't know either. We've been, as long as we've known each other, we we should have figured that out. I had no idea. Yeah, man. Yeah, uh, Carolina even. was a great place. I, I enjoyed Chapel Hill in the day, and then of course you know later, later, later on, Ryan Adams showed up out of there. Carborough, Chapel Hill, whatever. Yeah. Um. So you grew up in Chapel Hill. But I, I showed up in Athens. And, and I showed up in Atlanta, uh, Patrick, in, in early '70s and graduated from high school and right. you know went straight to UGA. So that I, I never left Athens really after that. What did your parents do? My dad was a research scientist, and he is a little little known fact. He actually he and another fella um, developed this uh, this this miracle stuff called uh, indoor outdoor carpet astroturf. He has the patent for it, but it all went to Monsanto. And because uh, that's the way it worked back then, if you were, you know, innovative with your ideas that belonged to the man and the corporation, that's just how they worked it. So he was always pulling rabbits out of the hat with new research. And my mom was a, a poet girl. They met at University of Virginia and uh, she quit school and married him and they went to Berlin. And he was still doing uh, the last year of service that he was in the military, Army Corps of Engineers. And they came back and had me and, you know, the rest is history. Good parents. They, they were good, good folks. And that's uh, um it's amazing how suddenly how many parallels there are. My dad was military too. Um, yeah, your, I knew that. Your dad played. Did your dad, your dad have a set of drums in the house all the time, or? No, he didn't. He didn't. He he had a set of Ludwig's early on, but he sold them. And then my first drum kit was obviously a, a, an old Slingerland set that had calfskin heads on it. And uh, he would go down. I, I would come home after school, and he'd already be down there, like you know, just taking an extended lunch, playing on the drums down in the basement. So, so yeah, how about you? I mean, where did you start playing? Uh, I, I, so, so my mom was musical, but stopped, uh, performing right after my brother and I were born. Was well, your mom a singer or a keyboard player? Opera singer. Um, Opera singer. Yeah, I knew this. Yes. Yes. And, um, she, uh, she had terrible stage fright and, uh, and, and sort of handle it with a combination of red wine and, and Valium and that ended up not working oh. out so great. Um, so she had a year where all of these other performers that she knew who she had partied with, this was of course the late sixties, early seventies. Um, uh-huh. many of them came to bad ends all in one year, two, two oh. ODs, a car accident and a suicide. And so, Oh my Lord, how do you survive any of that? Yeah. So she decided to get out of the business, um, and became, and went back to school, got her a master's in education and eventually her doctorate. So, uh, was that teaching music? Uh, no, um, well, she started teaching music, but then she got into guidance counseling. Uh, I think she had a, um, maybe she got a master's in sociology too. I can't remember, but, um, anyway, smart lady, uh, smart yeah. lady with smart kids. Well, um, the, the, the thing that may have been in the water, uh, that you were talking about, um, for my brother and I was probably just trauma. <laughs> yeah. It's a good, it, you know, it, it's not the worst diet if you could survive it, but right, it doesn't. It definitely you. throws things into philosophic sharp relief. You know, when you're having existential angst at 11 years old, and you're thinking, "Where is this coming from?" None of my peers seem to be smitten by this stuff. Do you had some of that though, huh? Oh, growing up, yeah, absolutely. Take that and combine it with the uh, the kind of dark old guard Catholicism, and I was I was down for the count. You were raised Catholic, huh? I was, yeah. Vatican right. I Catholic, huh? The uh... 
Oh my gosh, yeah, yeah. You're just you're, you're kind of taught to fear damnation at every turn, and it, yeah. it, it it had an effect. You know, I've I've written about you know death and grieving all of my life. I you know I can write the happy you know pop thing. I mean that's kind of what Capricorn wanted when we wound up in Austin in '92. We got signed. It's like well I can write a three minute thing that's got a hook to it. So, but that has been the thing. You have to watch it because you can go down that path by yourself a long time and and all of a sudden realize you're in deeper than you want to be. If it comes to just being creative and writing, I try to make sure there's no filters, which is the great thing about being, you know, purely independent. You know, um, you know, you think of people like, uh, oh, I can't remember the guy's name, Mark, what's his last name? The guy in Red House Painters. He's that kind of writer. Right. Um, you know what I'm saying? There's just yeah, no yeah. filters, and it's like it's a heart on the sleeve, but it's it's believable. It's not schmaltzy. It's just like, yeah, that's that's how everybody feels. That's perfect. And you said it in 15 words. That's incredible. Mm-hmm. I, I love that stuff. And I know it's kind of mopey, but you, if, you, if you make a study, I'd like to know what, he, what do you do to stay happy? What do you do to get back on the happy side after you've made a record like, you know, um, oh God, I'm trying to think of some of the things I bought recently by him. Um, there was one that was sort of a seasonal oriented record. I, I don't think it was called Autumn, but it was something along those lines. It was beautiful. Yeah. Anyway, I love that kind of stuff. With the, you know, I kind of do it from the Americana standpoint, but yeah. Well, when you say like, how do you how do you get back onto the side of of happy after sort of plumbing the steps? I mean, not. I think that that's a high expectation to set for yourself or for somebody else. I don't think everybody bounces back. I think some people just kind of live in it, you know. Yeah, it sounds like your mom struggled with it all of her life, huh? Oh yeah, oh yeah, she struggled. Well, she she was Appalachian and and poor, and um, oh wow, yeah, okay. and that's Mariah's clan. That's exactly yeah. where she comes from. One set of shoes a year, uh, in the fall before school. Wow, man. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's Mariah's history as well. Yeah. Her gang's from up in Abingdon, Virginia, and I know and, Abingdon. Uh, so yeah, yeah. So you you moved to Atlanta in the early seventies, uh, heading into high school. Um, you're already sort of wrestling with a kind of Catholic existentialism. Uh, what, were, what music were you listening to then? Well, it's funny because back then, you know, I, I was just playing drums, so I was I was you know listening to you know just the sort of standard you know um, you know a lot, lot of Who, Hendrix, Cream, those kind of bands. I like the Almond Brothers. I, I was kind of drawn to that sort of sound. I wasn't a huge fan of you know a lot of the Southern rock, the Southern rock kind of stuff, but you know it left an imprint. I like more of the British groups, I guess, in a lot of ways. There were other lesser bands out there. I guess one band called Trapeze, another one called Wishbone Ash. There were doing the dual guitar thing i remember uh, so this is, were you a thin lizzie fan yeah, i i wasn't but I, I i did well you know i should say yes yeah yeah it's kind of distant there was just so much out there that i was listening there was a station in atlanta called wplo and they were playing a lot of those things so that's kind of where i went with it how about you what were, we, what were your early influence were you listening to the the you know uh, three-piece rock bands like you know hendrix and cream and stuff like that oh yeah of course you're you're a lot younger than i am so not that much but a lot of acdc too Mm. I mean, that was like... Undeniable. Yeah, that is muscular. Yeah, which is why I like Townsend, the big muscular chords. Yeah. I, you know, learning to play guitar in the last few years, because um, now that I have a child, it's hard to play drums and practice late at night. Uh-huh. Um, I'm surprised at how simple so much of the rhythm parts for ACDC are. Right. Uh, and I don't mean simple bad. I mean simple perfect. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah the phrasing is impeccable. Yeah, Amazing. and that choice he made of those particular Gretsch pickups, um, you know, when you think of all the enormous yeah. stadium rock bands of history, they've all played, you know, almost all to a man, Gibson Les Pauls. Right. Um, something based on the design of the 59 Les Paul has... But kind of, he's playing like the filter trons, isn't he? Right, he's Gretsch playing Gretsch I, I'm a huge trons. Gretsch fan. Yeah. Well, and I've, in recent months, or this year, I I saw this band from Nashville called Smoking Flowers. A guitar player named Scott Collins um, is playing a big Gretsch hollow body with filter trons uh, into a, I think it's a bass man with a real nice. real rudimentary set of pedals, and it was just the greatest guitar sound I've ever heard. Uh, my jaw I know, was it's just, on the floor. It, it's organic. It yeah. really is. That That's kind of the direction I've gone in with the Gretches. I bought a Country Gentleman about three years ago, mm-hmm. and then last year got the uh, 6120, which is everybody refers to as the, you know, it's the vintage orange stain guitar. Right. 
and they ramp up really well, but they can be sweet as honey too. They clean up real, real well. Um, before that, I was I was doing the telly thing, but I've gotten a little bit less enamored of the of the Fenders. They, they're spanky and they do the twangy thing, but I, I'm not really a country player. Right. Um, but you know, it was the White Falcon was you know there there's there's some videos out there. Uh, I can't remember the guy's name now. He, he's the um, he's the second guitar player in Guns N' Roses now. And he plays a White Falcon through these old Supro amps. Mm -hmm. Bitchin'. Unbelievable. There's no pedals on the floor except for maybe a tiny little bit of slap back off a delay. Right. And it just rocks. Like when you mentioned the simplicity of that guy, Mr. Collins, set up from Nashville. Right. I thought, yeah, that's that's the way it goes. You just yeah, maybe, maybe just a little boost to push it over the top. And he's doing, he's not, he's using a lot of those seventh and ninth chords you would expect from a rockabilly player. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and I found out in a subsequent interview, I mentioned him in another interview with a um, band from Nashville, and they had played with his brother, and his brother's really into surf stuff, like, real into that Mose Wright, um, Walk, Don't Run, uh -huh. adventurous thing. And uh, so it explained it to me, but he's not a flashy player, but his chords are always the perfect chord. And, man, he's nice. he's just, I, dude, is under-recognized as a great guitar player. Smoking Flowers is the And duo. what was his band again? What's Smoking band? Flowers is what they're called. Okay. It's his wife. It she plays drums and sings and sometimes stands up and plays accordion or acoustic. She sings like an angel. And he sings harmonies. And their stuff has an almost retro, like, Wall, Phil Spector wall of sound thing. But their vocal uh -huh. harmonies are super tight, like X's vocal harmonies. Um, oh, wow. And so I oh, told them. Oh, that's very impressive. Oh, man, after the show, I ran up to them. I was like, you guys sound to me like X would have sounded if they'd been produced by Phil Spector. And they were like, <laughs> that's the best thing we've ever heard. So yeah. They said, you were a writer, right? Can I print that? That's yeah. perfect. What a great uh, what yeah. a great tribute line. That's they're, fantastic. They're great. So you came to Athens for college? Yeah, yeah, I wound up with a history degree, thought I was headed to seminary for a minute, and, you know, wound up, you know, quote, languishing, but in the good way, in Athens for another four years. Right. Uh, Catholic and seminary, then, or because when I met you, no, it wasn't. It, I, yeah. I had I had one of those get saved experiences, and I delved into it because I wanted to make sure it was the real deal. But, but uh, you know, I, and, and it's not like I, I tell people this because people get the wrong because there is a whole you know genre of music out there called praise and worship and contemporary Christian. It's like. I, I get associated with that sometimes, and yes, I've written spiritual songs where you know I'm I'm testifying and proclaiming, but it's not my agenda. And I, I tell people that, and, and you know, club owners all over the place, including the, the dear Forty White, was yeah, we love you guys, but God, you don't bring in any beer drinkers. And I know, I know, I know. Shit, I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, but I was sort of aware of that world. I I knew that there was. Is it the Cornerstone Festival? There's a Cornerstone Festival, yeah. And, and you played that, right? I did, and it, it, it there was a there was a fellow named Mark Hurd who was real. He's from Macon, actually. Uh, Mark was a real big Christian singer songwriter. But this is during the seventies when the Jesus movement was being propelled by fellows like Randy Stonehill and Larry Norman, and Mark was kind of part of that. Well, we had just gotten signed by Capricorn in ninety two, and we uh, ninety one. I uh, know ninety two. I'm sorry, South by Southwest. Mm -hmm. and we had this record called Killing Floor that hadn't been recorded yet. Um, there was a production company that inserted itself between us and Capricorn and basically governed all of the um, liaisons. They were the liaison. They be, and, and what ended up happening, excuse me, as I stumble through words here, what ended up happening is Mark ended up producing the record. So it was, it was me and Mark and Pete Buck. Uh, from REM, and it sounded great. John Keane was engineering, David Barbie was engineering. The record was superb. We had Billy Holmes playing the just crazy, crazy psycho Billy mandolin parts everywhere, right. and the record rocked. And it went in the charts. It went in the the low end of of the uh, of the CMJ charts, and it also started to crest in England a little bit. And so I thought, well, we're we're going to quit our day job. So we did it at least that much, and put together a band that wound up playing probably more at Eddie's Attic than ever in Athens. Uh, the Eddie seemed to embrace it. During that time when Vigilantes was ascendant and a lot of things were happening, there was a kind of like the sort of hipster Athens rejection of it was because you had written some songs about your relationship with your faith and people were like, yeah, I don't know about that guy. He's a Christian. And I was like, man, you know, there's that guy in your band who's apparently like a Hare Krishna and you don't seem to have a problem with that. And like, like you could be anything in this town as far as your spiritual beliefs and be still hip except Christian. Like you could be Buddhist or Zoroastrian or 
Krishna. Or, right. Uh, and I and I always thought that was odd. Because I hear you. Because I, I would tell people, look, I know Bill, and his relationship with God is gritty and it's existential and it's about feeling like you're falling short. It's some of that sort of we were talking about the sort of uh, yeah, man. We Vatican all do. One we, we, Catholicism. And, and it was no, interesting. I, I so appreciate you saying this because we all, you know, there's never a day. It's all grace. There's nothing we do. And, and I will tell you this. There were times, I think, when maybe I was a self-righteous son of a bitch and deserved being taken down a notch. But I, I never felt like the faith was an agenda. It was something that, that pulled me out of out of uh, sort of existential darkness that, yeah. that had occasionally – suicidal inclinations right and and i i just so when you cling to something you know like a the lighthouse in the storm you cling to it and you believe in it and it may not be for everybody but it was it was for me yeah. so that's that's really but you're right i mean anytime things get played out in a scene you know especially with a you know with a um, the the journalistic oracle like the flagpole or the the hack writers at the red and black at the time i don't mean to just you know disparage them but they were just never really full orbed stories that got everything that's why i always like the format of the extended interview because at least you got to you know kind of test your metal against a good questionnaire um but athens just it, it i i love the scene i love the energy i love the bands that the, most of the bands that i like just didn't actually get they didn't get noticed i thought paul lombard's bands were great but yeah totally. I, I think you know it's just great it's like he was way ahead of the curve as far as the yeah. jangly guitar you know, Americana thing. I thought, golly, day, Paul, you know, you're great. What is going on here? You know, why can't you get noticed? But a, a lot of the Athens fans that I like, there, it's just, it's it's a huge pond. There's so much talent. There's so much energy there. And But there's also a little bit of a flavor of the month kind of dynamic in any scene. I don't care whether it's Austin or Nashville or Athens. It's it's just there, and you have to learn to deal with it. So we, we got our, our toe in the water, got a little bit of, of, of notice, and then we got out of town. We toured incessantly. What year was it that we played together at South by Southwest? We played that show at that club that wasn't a regular club that opened just for South right. by Southwest. That's right. That's right. You guys were right after us. Was that 92? I remember Mike wearing, wearing the hoodie, and you guys came out doing Weirdo, I think. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But, and then it got shut down. That was the opener down. song, right? Yeah. Unbelievable. That show uh, was at overcapacity, oversold the show, and then the fire marshal shut it. Fire marshal reached over and tried to turn Mike's amplifier off. <laughs> Which, That's right. You guys were like two or three songs in, right? About four, I think. And then there was sort of a semi-riot when they shut us down. It was pretty wild. Was that 92? It was 92. Yeah, so that's right. I we forgot were both... that. Man, that was riveting. I can still see Mike up there just looking forlorn and lost and playing those opening because he's just hitting the guitar chords and singing. You guys haven't jumped in yet. Well, he wasn't singing on the PA either. Like he was would step out in front of the monitors and sing, and it would bring the whole room down to near silence and riveting. And that, that room was an amazing was, performer. Was so packed, like there was there wasn't enough room. To, like you couldn't shuffle a set of cards in there. Like it was so packed. There was a, and the PA was Fisher Price. I mean, come yeah. on, it was pathetic and then the whole thing exploded and, and then the, somehow the fire marshal got wind of the thing and shut it down and yeah we were in it was in the whole the show got written up in usa today and for a minute there my dad thought i was successful but uh did you guys ever play, were, there, were, were there any other austin shows you played that that uh south by southwest we've played a bunch of south by southwest and interestingly that wasn't the last time we got shut down in mid-show <laughs> at south by it happened this last spring we played south by and um the um, sound man at the venue, and I don't want to do too much of a digression here, but just I'll say briefly, uh, my last interview that just came out this week was with the head of Chicken Ranch Records, and he signed this trip hop act from New Delhi called Como Rebi, and I played with her. She's a solo sort of artist, usually plays with a drummer. A drummer couldn't get a visa, so I filled in, and then the sound man was nice. just absolutely like dismissive, unhelpful, just absolutely the opposite of what our professional is sound man which we run into on the road all the time if you don't not a touring musician you probably don't know what i'm talking about but trust me on this and um there's certainly an element of sexism there and an element of racism and an element of just like i'm i'm, I'm above this gig and um it made me so angry that i i, I was after the show i was kind of venting outside and five eight was like yeah we're gonna we're gonna punish this guy so <laughs> when we played um we played most of our set and then Mike, you know, threw his guitar down and let it feed back and then started climbing the PA like it was Mount Everest and the sound man went insane. Oh, and, good for Mike. And ran That's out, great. killed the stage power, 
or kill the PA power. So it was just the amp, ampl, we have amplifiers the size of refrigerators though. So it was still plenty loud. And then one by one walked around turning off amplifiers. And then he started to reach for me and I just played this extended like Bonham-esque groove solo. Uh, are you still playing the Vista lights? Uh, no, this was a, um, well, that's a, I've got this set of early seventies Ludwig thermoglosses now, and they're the best. Oh, nice. I've ever owned. I know what those are. Those are cool. Yeah. I was waiting for that guy to put his hand on me. Cause then we were going to really punish him. But I think he figured out that he was just about to fall into that trap and, uh, just walked oh, away. Man. Um, but yeah, that's, that's our, we've repeatedly been shut down at South by Southwest now, which I think is pretty special. Yeah, I don't know. I, I wish I'd. I the only thing I can say to any. I wish I'd been there for that. I it was wish good. I had been there for that. It was good. That guy. Yeah, he was. He was not. I'd have been giving Mike a a, a a foot boost up the up the PA columns. Oh man, people were all about it. It was pretty great. Um, so, so, did I? Was I the first person to ever play drums with vigilantes? I, I think you might have been. Yeah, I think you might have been. There was there was another fellow I think that kind of filled in a little bit here and there and we just didn't think he was he was very good the, the very first incarnation of the band that we went on the road with was mm -hmm. um, eric agner and a, a drummer i cannot remember his name and then and newt carter was playing guitar it wasn't um, um uh it wasn't new orleans um he now plays with sugarland um oh come on Brandon. no it wasn't travis mcnail travis yeah yeah um, no travis was actually down the line a little bit um and we actually had an audition from um, who's the guy that uh, they had local Athens guy? He's a, he's great. I'm, ben? The name is Ben. Uh, ben, yeah. yeah. Ben, ben actually auditioned, um, and and I, I hope he's not listening because he'll hate me for it. But we thought he was too stiff. <laughs> oh man! Well, then he went on to be in Counting Crows. So and then he went on to be yeah <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So screw us, right? Right. So anyway, but no, he's great. And then when I saw the Crows, um, you know, play uh, in in Athens years later, I thought, man, you are really really rocking. It is great. He's like he became like the heartbeat of that band. I think. No, oh, he's a great drummer. Um, great drum yeah so we but the way that we ended up playing together we've been friends forever and there's so many like times that our personal lives were intertwined like i stole your black bean recipe once watching you cook for the family it's like i still make them exactly <laughs> like that but um, i didn't know that that's great yeah, yeah. garlic I just is the answer swung by the house over there on i guess that was hill street and you were cooking yep. and i was like uh-huh this is how you stretch a dollar and a quarter worth of black beans into a week's worth of food um, yeah, I did the house dad thing with Josh and Joe, you know, when uh, yeah. cause Brenda was working, uh, you know, as a social worker and had a better job. But, you know, I thought, well, you know, they, they stay little so very short amount of time. So I was working for like the Rutland program, um, which was working with emotionally disturbed kids. I was working out in Jackson County and, uh, you right. know, doing the music thing here and there. And uh -huh. I thought, I I'm just going to stay at home with them. You know, Josh showed up. Joe was, you know, five years later. So I did like, I think three or four years with Joe and Josh Tilly was in first grade. So I wouldn't trade it for the world. You, you know how it goes. It's like yeah, they, man. You you're missing all the good things they show up with. Uh, I got laid off from my IT job last fall. Now I do a podcast and play drums for different bands and I'm home a lot. It's good. Man, I, I've noticed your resume has gotten really thick all of a sudden with the drum thing. That's excellent. Well, it's been good um but so i was playing with someone at the at the downstairs and was setting my drums up before you guys played and it was that was billy i think and johnny yep. and you and it was just the three of you and i had my oh, brushes. There was a guy playing accordion a guy a guy named mark hall played it would you have the accordion player yeah that's mark yeah exactly that's mark yeah he's the one who mark hall, yeah. yeah um and then you guys did a sound check and i just sat down <laughs> and somehow like just like cl clung on and, and through sound check and into the gig and thought we did a lot of shuffle beats i remember yeah. this now it was the yeah. downstairs and it was you so you you were the first drummer yeah and mark was really happy with it because he was always like oh i don't want drums i don't want bass you know it's like no mark this is this is going to be good and, yeah. and i think you pulled out some brushes or hot rods and and it was it was it was brushes good marriage. I, I didn't get into brushes. hot rods until go. later yeah but like um you know I was a big uh, John Convertito fan uh, from now Calexico, then Giant Sand, and I've been, been working on figuring out how to play drum kit with acoustic instruments, and and uh, yeah. that was the sort of first. <laughs> I mean, I, I, years later, I thought, hey, did I just like force myself into that band? I hope nobody's mad. <laughs> No, man, I wish we could have kept you, but I know 5-8 was rocking hard and taking off, and we were just getting our thing together. Yeah, we really weren't. stars were rising fast. And so then, yeah, a couple of years of, of that trio, and then gradually Newt comes in, 
David Labriere, as I recall, was on oh, base for a while. Oh, insanely great bass player. Yeah, he's yeah. in Nashville now too. Yeah. Um, and Travis, and it was that was the band that played with us that we when we played together at South by. It was Labriere, Newt, yeah. um, and Travis. And man, that was a crazy show. It, it, that's a it, definite one of the greatest. Live I forgot shows you guys life. got shut down. It was like we I think we did a forty minute set, maybe a, a two minutes longer or something like that, and got I felt pretty good about it. It was bananas. It was bananas. It was so good. There was so, it was so it was raining outside, and so the moisture was literally running down the walls inside the club. Yeah. Now we were soaked to the skin. We walked into the little green room back there, and because I'd seen photos of him, and this guy extends his hand and he says, "Hi, my name is Phil Walden." Right. I thought, oh my God, that you you were you were royalty. You managed Otis. You managed Otis. Right. You know, golly, he was a law student at the University of, uh, uh, I guess, in in um, Emory. Right. 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 He's at Emory Law School, and you know, so here I I I don't even know what to say. I, I didn't even know what to say. He said, "We we want to talk to you boys back at your hotel." So we we. Had, we got the gear in the van as fast as we could, and then we got in his limo. Honest to God, got in his limo and drove back, and and just talked about the the generalities of what a deal would look like. You know, the Capricorn was all about they they didn't do any videos. We were pleading with them, begging them to do a video for Real Downtown, because that song was burning up 99X mm-hmm. and a couple other, uh, and numerous other AAA stations that were. It was a fledgling radio format in the early 90s, but we were on about 90 out of the existing 120. Plus the modern rock station of you know of, of, of WXRT. Let's contextualize. I'm not that. WXRT. I mean, uh, but, but it, it, it they they didn't want to do the video thing. They didn't want right. they, you know, they 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 wanted the band on the road at playing 180 shows a year, and it, it kind of killed us. Let's uh, so so the Capricorn thing came along after. Weren't there two Vigilantes records out before that? Wasn't Welcome to Struggle? There Bill? were and. There was there was one there was there was one called Jugular, which was an acoustic right. record that Mark and I did out in. Um, uh, there was a guy named Ch- uh, Cam Mullally out in Arnoldsville, Georgia. We recorded it in two days at a little uh, shack out there, and that was the one that we basically had out. And then the other one was called Driving the Nails. That's it, Driving um, the Nails. Yeah, which was you know very fueled by just Billy and I and uh, a couple a rhythm a rhythm section that we picked up in Atlanta, and that that record actually got some some buzz you know kind of. Folk, folk punk or whatever the verbiage was back then so i had written the stuff for killing floor but didn't really have anybody to play it yet billy was still part of the equation and we had been road testing that in atlanta for about six months and uh, this is i i, I can't say enough good stuff about billy holmes i, I know billy has you know a a, a incendiary in, you know um a reputation in athens and he is definitely a um, he can be a live wire, but I love him. He's a crazy talented musician, and and I know he offended and hurt a lot of people's feelings. But at the same time, I mean, it's a small town with a small town, you know, buzz wire when it comes to you know information right. traveling through the news services. But Billy had never played mandolin before he met me, and I asked him, "How did you do this?" He said, "And this is the honest to God truth. I watched him do it." He said, "Well, I just put on equal parts Eddie Van Halen, and then I would put on a Bill Monroe record, and I would take the Bill Monroe record." And I would play the Eddie Van Halen licks on it. That's amazing. And that's how we learned how to play mandolin. And he, he has such a great sense of music theory and, you know, yeah. first, second, and third positions. It was sick. It was just sick how great he got on the thing real quick. So yeah, he yeah. was wowing people. And that kind of became the centerpiece against the lyricism and the storytelling of, of Killing Floor. But then we had to go out and find we had to go out and find a band, you know, to play it. I think enough time has passed that I, I had forgotten all that stuff about Billy, about um, the 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 sort of politics of small town music scenes, but I remembered that he was a great. He's uh he played keys on a five eight song or two uh, at John Keys. All right. Yeah, yeah. He he could play everything. I don't. He remember. has a, a closet full of those old Mellotrons and synthesizers and things. Yeah. But he collected that stuff. Huge Todd Rundgren fan, as you probably know. Yeah, yeah. Do you stay in touch with Billy? I don't. I I hit him once in a while because he's moved around. I think he's down in Florida now. I know he. I think he worked at Chick Piano. Yeah, Yeah. yeah, you know, a little bit, you know, here and there. And we we had just put out Killing Floor, sort of a retrospective on vinyl last year, Mm -hmm. which went down real well. You know, I mean, vinyl's so ridiculously expensive, but you know, I think we blew through like you know two hundred copies, which is pretty good for for us. um, Yeah, uh, yeah. the thing. And it sounded great. There's a company up in uh, Columbus, Ohio called Gotta Groove Records. One of the few people that actually will remaster from a CD and and make it, you know, viable on a on a vinyl surface. They did in, an incredible job. I think it sounds better than the original. Um, but anyway, there you go. But That's yeah, great. Billy, I, I, you know, we 
you know, he he would get himself in as much hot border as 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 much as he would get people's accolades. So yeah. you know, after a while, I think we we got a we got a part company. But God bless him, he's just an incredible musician, and people mellow with years. You know, they really do. I mean, I, I've noticed it. You know, hopefully in myself, I, I I'd like to think I've become a little more kinder and a little more. You know, all embracing. Where, like I said, I was just a self-righteous son of a bitch on some days, and I just, I, I look back on that and think, really? Why, why did you, why did you say that sort of stuff? Why did you even go there? Well, we all go through I'm our twenties, you know. Like, I guess I, uh, everyone's always so right in their twenties, in their minds, yeah. you know. <laughs> You know what it brought out to me, though, and you don't have to – you can agree or disagree with this. Athens really in the early years, and we're talking – you know, I, I mean I, uh, I was sitting in um, the El Dorado when Burt Downs walked through the door with the premier copy of Chronic Town, 1981. And I looked at it and I thought, wow, this is great. Because I'd already seen Orion play, you know, four or five, six times. And I thought, this is so good. This is so, I was so excited. But even after that, Athens was really – here's the word I'm going to use. It was a competitive town when it came to bands. The bands weren't oh, oh so nice. They might be in print, but there was a lot of competition going on between, you know, getting that Friday or Saturday at the 40 watt. And, and after a while, it's just like, I, I'm not made for this sort of stuff. I can't do it. Yeah, you know, I I think this, there was certainly some of that. I I got here in 88. Mm-hmm. And, uh, or, you or like, came from Binghamton, right? No, no, 5-8 came from Binghamton, but I, I came later. Like they had been here, they, I think right. they got here in eighty six or eighty seven, and they had uh, Mike Palmatier as a drummer. But I didn't right, get right, here that's right. until New Year's Day of New Year's Eve of eighty eight, New Year's Day of eighty nine, and um, yeah. and uh, there was it was fairly competitive, but like you know they that that old saying the battles are so bloody because the rewards are so small. Um, <laughs> Because <laughs> all there was was the battles, you know. I don't know that phrase, but I love it. Yeah, uh, and, and so, but I think that sort of mellowed out some. I mean, and certainly, like just like you, with the uh, Capricorn era vigilantes, five eight was just on the road all the time, so we weren't really here for it. Like it took me about a year after I got here to join five eight, another nine months after that for us to start doing two hundred shows a year. So. Wow, that's the and that's that's about twenty five, forty more than we were doing. We were we were doing like maybe one. So we were just trying to keep you know these things called relationships intact. It, well, it let's talk about better. that a little if you're comfortable with it. When I met you, you were married to Brenda. Uh, you were doing a lot of like stay at home dad stuff with 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 your sons and 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 yet you're like the demands of your career were ever increasing from pretty much the day we met until um, until you moved away. Uh, and um, and I remember that you had this amazing dog that got hit by a car. Yeah. And from a distance, that felt like a low point. Like, like I ran into you right after it happened, and I had we I'd been by the house. I used to walk up and down Hill Street because when I was sort of semi homeless, I stayed with my brother a lot. He lived there mm-hmm. on Hill Street, and I was in a deep depression, and so it was always good to check in, you know. Just like I would often see you on the porch and stuff, and you had this great like I guess was it a lab puppy? Yeah, actually, I think that the the dog that was struck, uh, uh, Patrick was mm-hmm. was Joshua's dog. It was a dog named Hudson. That's it. And uh, he had bolted across the street. I think he had seen a squirrel or a cat, and mm-hmm. he darted out the front door. And there was a car coming down the road, and it was just like you know you could sort of see the logistics, the uh, yeah. the trajectories. And I thought he's he's not going to make that car. That he's going to get hit. And sure enough, and he he died. The dog died in my arms. Yeah, and then I saw you not long after that, and was like, "Where's the dog?" And you were like, "The earth is a dark place, and I am in the darkest of its dark places." <laughs> I was like, okay. "Oh shit, <laughs> Bill is not okay." <laughs> Bill has not had his coffee this morning. Yeah, no. Uh, I mean, you were you didn't say literally those things, but like there were. I, I was like, "No, oh, this is not great." And then you know, I found out that. You told me that Hudson had been hit by a car, and and um, and I felt like things changed for you a lot after that. Like that may have been sort of one of those. Um, I think that was a component. I, I think the the bigger the bigger component, it, you know, that's not gainsaying anything. I mean, because things like that become symbolic in their own, right. you know, kind of sad ways. You know, a, a dog dying in your arms. I mean, he was a beautiful dog. I think he's still a puppy. I don't think he was two yeah. years old yet. No, he was great. Um, but the. Uh, 
having to deal, I, I know how to do the song or anything. I know how to rehearse a band, but trying to keep people interested. And when you can't really pay them anything, you're making just chicken feed out on the road. It's like, I, I don't, we would always, it was rinse repeat sort of thing. We'd always go out on the road and we'd come back and replace the bass, bass player and or drummer every year. Mm-hmm. And after we did like seven albums, you know, after record number seven, four, which were done for Capricorn, I thought, I, I can't do this anymore. I, I can't deal with the superstructure. I can't deal with the expectations. I can't deal with the, the dynamic that, that is clearly going toward ruination, and and I don't want to be part of it, you know. So I, I had to kind of rethink what that was going to look like, um, and what it was going to be, and it and it meant, you know, we we cut bait with uh, Fingerprint Records, we cut bait with Capricorn, we released two records right after that, um, independently. One was called Roof of the Sky. I cannot remember the name of the other one. It seems like there was an EP about that time, mm-hmm. and we went out in the van, and sure enough, we, we ended up selling about 15,000 copies just straight out of the truck, which was great. Right. And it, it gave me a little bit of a renewed sort of thing. It's like, well, and here's where I'm going with that. I thought, I don't need, I don't need a super, super structure's permission to be a songwriter or be in a band. So it felt like an embracing of the indie thing that was, that was coming, it was working for us. And this is still in a day and age where major labels were still trying to galvanize, you know, their their tentacles, so to speak, in the in the uh, you know new rock sort of thing. You know, bands were signing two hundred fifty thousand dollar record deals. You know, right. and they might be good for one or two records, but they weren't putting out three or four. I thought, hell, I want to be in it like Tom Petty and Neil Young. I want to be le- releasing records, you know, until I'm until I'm dead. Mm-hmm. You know, that's that's why I'm doing it. I'm not just doing it so I can go back to my barista job later on. I just didn't hear bands putting out records that I thought were going to be. Um, I thought they were good, and I was glad for everybody's success, truly. But I just thought, wow, we are somehow getting passed over here, but I don't have the chutzpah to get inside the superstructure and make things happen so that I'll have a consistent band of the same four or five people. It's just not going to take place. So that was a lot of the discouragement that you sensed for me. Um, and I, I think it probably did have um, some impact on you know everything from my personal life to the way the band was going. Um, but it... It also made me realize that I didn't have to write for anybody except, you know, myself. There was no audience to write for. You just, you know, open your heart, open a vein, and see what happens. Yeah. Also, I think, and this is just me looking in from the outside, but your uh, work at that time was very sort of proto-Americana. And um, it was. Uh, and so the players that you were working with were a lot of, like, jobbing guys who would now live in Nashville. Nashville hadn't become a sort of central point for sidemen at, at that time. I mean, certainly they were there, but they were also sidemen in Atlanta and kind of just floating around always on tour buses. And I remember a conversation I had with Newt Carter, who was your lead player for a couple of years. And as I was leaving 5-8, which was not long after this sort of time period we were discussing, and I was like, man, I just want to be a professional sideman. And he said, no, you don't. Because it's a dark hard life that you're living paycheck to paycheck a lot of these guys who've been doing it 20 years have kids in a couple of states and it's uh um well newt said that that's that's pretty amazing yeah i mean newt and i used to have these hour and two hour conversations on the phone um because we would we would both be in an airport somewhere or um I would be home from a tour for a minute and I would just like, I wonder what Newt's up to. And I'd, I'd give him a buzz and, and, and we would just like reground each other. And, and I think that this was maybe right after he left, uh, the vigilantes touring lineup and was doing more studio work. And, and, you know, he'd just been around the block a few more times than I had at that point. And, um, yeah, his, his thing was like, I mean, it becomes uh, a kind of lonely life to not have a house to live in and a dog. And, um, yeah. And, and so like, I think that part of what's happening when you're, when you're driving or being driven around the country in a van with a bunch of professional, uh, side men is that, um, people end up kind of cocooning into this very existential place and they either handle it well or handle it badly, but all the same, it's even though you're with four or five people all the time, you can be also really lonely. Yeah, that, that's true. See, I, I got lucky in that because the only side man that we ever worked, see, I, and it's funny where it came from because we got a drummer and a, a, a name Scott Kloffenstein. And then later on, uh, that was Kevin Hoyer up in South Carolina now. And Ke- Kevin was a New York guy. He was from Rochester. Right. Kevin was a great drummer. And then Jake Bradley, who is also playing in Nashville now, and, and he's a, a pickup artist, incredibly great, gifted bass player, also a guitarist now. He's, his guitar chops are 
very Eddie Cochran, you know, kind of uh, old school, you know, rockabilly. He's great at it. Uh, and then Ken Hudson. Kenny Hudson was the guitar player. So that band of Kevin on drums, Jake on bass, and Kenny Hudson on guitar and mandolin, that was the band that we walked into Buddy Miller's studio with in 1999 and made Audible Sigh. Right. And we cut like 25 songs in three weeks. Um, it was great. There were some side people that came in, but for the mo- I think Buddy played on maybe two songs, and then Julie Miller, Buddy's wife, sang on five or six songs on the record. That was the record that charted in England. We couldn't get No Depression magazine to even listen to it hardly. It was, and that was the bastion then of you know whether or not you were going to be country alt enough. And they just they didn't think we counted. I mean, it's, that's kind of the word we got back from them. The strangest thing to me. It was weird, and, and, it, and it did piss me off. I thought, well, wow, you know, this is just another obstacle. We've paid the dues. We've been out there. We've been doing it. Buddy Miller is like, you know, I mean, they even voted him like their, their top player or their, their our artist of the decade is what Buddy got. And I, I love mm-hmm. Buddy. I love his music. I love his approach to it. Um, he, he really is, you know, one of that one of those respected people in Nashville. The, the thing I found out about the way it works with musicians, and Newt's dead on right because you go, you go play those lonely nights you know, like the old Tom T. Hall songs. Right. You know, you go play those. You go play those lonely nights, and you and you you hope that somehow or another you're going to get off the road, or at least get out of the car in the van, and get on the bus, and then you do your 10 to 15 years on the bus in hopes of becoming one of the five guys that are the five drummers in Nashville that are the go-to drummers, or the five bass players, or the go-to bass players, or guitars or pedal steel, just fill in the blank. You you hopefully, but by that time, you know, you're you're 65 years old. Right. Um, and you know, then then you get to you know play in Alison Krauss's band on her records and in her bus. You get that kind of. I mean, she's got the pro band of the pro bands, and I'm sure there are other people there. I, I ventured into Nashville three different times in my life. One was in the early '90s, another one with Capricorn, and then another one later on with the independent label that helped us make um, Audible Sigh. And every time I felt like, wow, I I don't know. I, I there's a superficiality about how songs get written here and how they come to life here. And I, it just didn't feel like it meshed to me. I think that at Nashville is the crossroads of art and commerce these days. And um, there's a lot of bodies buried by the road uh, at that intersection. Um, <laughs> That's grim. You, well, I mean, it's true, though. Like, Yeah, no, no absolutely. Uh, and um, I think that, I mean, I really love Nashville. I love going there. Um, and I've, you know, I've done my share of like dipping in and making 150 bucks a song and all that. But, um, I also, um, think that with the sort of decentralization of the music industry and the fact that you can have a recording studio in your bedroom now, like it's also just as valid to, to find a place, you know, uh, near Jose Mondragon's, uh, father's bean field, uh, uh, and, and, and put your roots down there. I think I think things have changed. I, I, when I speak, I'm talking, I'm talking about Nashville from like 1990 to 2000. That's it. That's yeah. all I know. I, I've been so out of it for so long now that it's just mm-hmm. I don't have time to concentrate on anybody else's stuff. I'm just trying to make a living and sell a few more albums, you know. But the songs keep coming, and right. and, and I love that. Um, Newt's right. Just back on him. I mean, what a, you know, a lot of people don't know this about him. He was also a great songwriter. Um, I don't know if his his canon of songs has actually survived, but I remember when I first heard the very first song I ever heard him write and sing on. Um, what was the name of the band? Golly Day, come on! It was a song called Ordinary Day, and it was as good as anything that Roger McGuinn ever put out. I swear, it was beautiful. It was it was lush. It was jangly. It was gorgeous. Uh, it reminded me of a lot of the stuff that later on, you know, REM kind of galvanized that sound on Murmur. And I thought, man, that has been new. was 15 years old when he wrote that song. What? Yeah, 15 years old. And he was living in a tent, as I'm told. I don't know if this is the part of the urban legend, but I believe he was living in a tent on top of a building in downtown Athens. Incredible. That is amazing. You know who would know? I know. Is, is Tom Lewis would know. Tom, Tom probably would know, yeah. Hey, Lewis, yeah, oh, yeah. Lewis ought to be the three-way on this one. Heck, yeah. Well, Lewis, I, got, he's, I'm going to touch base with him soon. I haven't seen him. We've, we've worked on a couple of records together at, at 1093 Studios here in Athens. Um, yeah. Tom's a genius. So when did you when did you make the decision to leave Athens? 
Uh, Mariah and I left Athens. Let's see. My parents had both died. We they they succumbed within like two years of each other, mm-hmm. and we stayed there to kind of walk them through those last chapters. Uh, my parents had moved to Athens just to kind of to kind of be nearby. Wow. Um, and they they I think my dad was seventy eight and my mom was seventy seven, but they they both left about. I'm pretty close to the same time, like I said, about two years. And then we moved up to near Asheville. We were looking to get into Asheville uh, just for a change, really. And then because uh, we were just doing, I was, the only thing I had to record on was a DAT player. So we were we were doing these, you know, DAT recordings and, and posting them and, and, you know, seeing a little coin, playing a little, playing a lot up and down the mid-Atlantic, East Coast kind of thing. And then we moved to Saluda, North Carolina, which is outside of Asheville, lived in a cabin up there. And that was a, that was a good kind of getting out. Um, it was, you know, striking out of my, I hadn't actually been out of Athens ever for years, uh, you know, in, in terms of a place to live and call home. And we lived up in the mountains. It was great. A little mountain town just outside of Asheville, about 30 minutes. Mm-hmm. So that was, I guess, about 14 years ago. We we're coming up on 15 years of marriage. So that was about 14 years back. Right. And then, then, then you moved out West. 2009. Yeah. It, yeah. Thanks, Mariah. But that was about 2009. And then we moved out West, um, you know, not that, about nine years ago, coming up on 10. So I remember, like, there was always this kind of, you were sort of a man caught between two worlds through most of the 90s, in my perception, because there was this sort of thing in Athens where, like, Bill's just too religious for me, and then there was all the religious people who were like, Bill writes a lot of songs that don't mention Jesus, and I th- I'm uncomfortable with that. <laughs> and, like... Like I said, your relationship with your faith was grittier and more existential than most people's. It wasn't all sunshine and rainbows and praise and worship. Um, and then you uh, you got divorced, and my perception was that a chunk of that community of faith, community of redemption and forgiveness, just turned its back on you. Oh and, yeah, yeah. I, no, I still feel it. I yeah. still feel it. yeah. I, I, I we we've pretty much shaken hands with poverty ever since, and I, and I, I say that with absolute uh, deadpan seriousness. Th- things have things have equalized. I mean, I think some of those people have stayed. You know, the people that you refer to, that particular demographic, have kind of come back around. There has been, and then sometimes it's been because they've gone through their own dark nights of the soul, their own failings, and their own falls. Uh, that that's kind of nice and it's refreshing. It's like, yeah, you know, we're all, none of us are made out of stern stuff. You know, we're all kind of made out of clay. And, and when you wake up to that, it's actually liberating. You know, you, you stop berating yourself and say, well, yeah, I'm, I'm a fuck up, but it's a big club. And, yeah. you know, you, you learn to kind of rejoice in that and you, you start writing a different song and you start extending this thing called grace and mercy to yourself first. Right. So you can extend it to the whole world. I mean, I feel like you and Davis on have both kind of walked that path of, of, uh, of, of finding yourself like having been uneasy members of that community for a number of years and then having like transgressed whatever their inchoate yeah. internal boundary is and then just get in the back of their hand hardcore. Yeah, there's a deep sense of ownership when they find an artist that they can believe in, so to speak, and and, and they, but they, the ownership is, and I, I Dave Bazan is a perfect example because I think he felt like it was so, uh, I felt like he was suffocating, and I know when I talked to Dave because Dave played Cornerstone, he and Pedro played Cornerstone, he played solo and he played with the band. I loved it, riveting performances every single time, mm-hmm. and not everybody got them, but I I got where they were coming from and what they were doing. Even though we were very you know dissimilar musically, we would sit down and have a beer back at the hotel, and you know he was telling me I, I could tell that there were these sea changes going on underneath. You know, right. uh, another guy that you might have heard of, a friend of his, uh, and a, a kind of a distant friend, another guy named Damien Gerardo. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think Damien was on Sub Pop as well. Um, uh, but he's he, same sort of thing, more of a folky orientation. But, you know, as soon as you step outside, like you said, those sort of well-prescribed boundaries of, you know, safety and and whatever, you know, they, they, they'll drop you like a... Yeah. Like I said, I never wrote for them anyway. I wrote to make sense out of my life, not to make them feel good about their coolness or whatever. Right. Well... David is somebody I definitely want to talk to on this podcast, and I'm hoping to. Oh, right on! That would be great. He, yeah. he's a good interview. You, you, you sometimes have to pull things from him. I mean, he's you know I, I you you know give me a I, I I say way too much and talk I blab way too much, but Dave, you kind of have to extract it from him and excavate yeah. it. But he'll give you a deep, thoughtful answer about these things. Yeah. Well, I'm. Hoping I don't know that. where he's at. I you know people have said oh he's he's you know thrown out the faith. I, you know what does that even you know mean? You know, he's, I mean, he may I have thrown out, out your version of the faith. 
you know. <laughs> exactly. I, I, I tend to think that's what it is. Yeah. But see, that's the problem with the, this sort of, you know, in, in some ways, if I can just, you know, stand on the outside and look at, you know, modern fundy evangelicalism or whatever it is. Um, you know, there's this there's this sort of tendency to to judge the world and the broken, you know, sad people that are in it. And, you know, as long as you're living up to their expectations, you can be their hero. But like I said, that sense of ownership is unbelievable. After a while, the pressure is ridiculous. And nobody would want the job anyway. Right. Um, but so I feel like we we uh, we talked as you were deciding to move out west and you were talking about the light and the architecture and the feeling like that when you went there, that you should have been there the whole time. Um, that it was in a way kind of perfectly suited for you, your, where you needed to be. And I've always felt like there have been a group of hardcore fans that are going to follow your work out of pure appreciation for it, not because they feel a sort of orthodoxy or ownership of it. But um, it seems like since you've been out there, you've been just cranking out a couple of records a year and putting them, self-releasing them and, and kind of just staying busy and continuing to do the work and continuing to dig deep into sort of soul searching and stuff. Yeah, that's, that's been the plan. It's, it's been more just because the touring, nobody knows who I am out in the Southwest really. I mean, there's a few groups of folks, but all the markets are back East. Uh, it's funny because Mariah and I've been having this conversation for the last three days. We're we're gonna you know put the gear in the van and start touring again as a, as the folk duo just to you know bring it to the people so to speak because we haven't toured for probably going on yeah eight years at least, uh, and it we've definitely felt it. It's one of the reasons why I've had to sell off you know a lot of guitars and beloved instruments just to kind of make ends meet. But yeah. that comes to the territory. You know if you're in it for a long time you just realize, you know, and you're a carpenter you might have to sell a hammer once in a while. So I I, I don't yeah. put a lot of stock in that. I, I have developed you know. Every musician develops relationships with their instruments, you know, where they were, what it played on, how it felt to, you know, be behind that kit of drums, hitting that snare or that ride cymbal or whatever. You you get connected to it, and then when you have to part with it, you know, it's like, golly, the end of the world. You know, but, you know, I, I've gotten I've gotten around it, and, I, and I've been lucky. There are those people there that continue to, you know, keep coming in and short up. And i I got to be honest with you. I mean, I'm a Dylan fan, but I don't own every Dylan record. Uh, but, I'm, you know, this new album that's coming out will be eight, albums number 82 and 83. And, and I joke about it, but there's part of me that's serious, Patrick. It's like, how, how many Bill Maloney records do you need? And my answer is, I need to make them all, but I don't know that you, the buyer, need to buy them all. But it sure would be nice if you would at least listen to them, because to me, there's been a growth post VOL, and I wish people would, I, I wish more people would have embraced that. But it's it's such an overstocked pond. It's such a, you know, you know, it, the singer songwriter thing. I mean, you know, throw a rock and you hit one, right? Right. So it. I, I'm lucky. I'm lucky. There are people that are still coming in. There are people that are still listening. Um, and and I, in this day and age where it's all, you know, just every, everything's up for grabs, overstock pond, whatever it, it feels like, the shelf is, is just full. I, I feel I feel lucky to be able to have anybody, really, in some ways, that's still involved in it. I mean, you know, 80 records and 28 years into this sort of thing. I mean, come on. I had forgotten some of these incidents where you and I were, you know, crossing paths and talking about it. I, I'm, I'm, I'm really surprised that we didn't, we didn't start a band again. I guess there's always time. Well, I was just always so busy with Five Eight, but I mean, I'm on two Vigilantes albums. Yep. Um, you played on uh, Friendly Fire and uh, right. Dear Life, didn't you? Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, see, those records still hold water. Those, and it's interesting. I'm, I'm glad you reminded me of this. Because those records were really the two first solo records. I'd made electric solo records with Tom uh -huh. Lewis. Yep. And but it was still the Vigilantes playing it. I was just it was just a solo record, you know. But Jake was still playing bass, Kevin drums. I was stretching as a guitar player, you know. All of a sudden, you know, the guitar had you know ten pedals on the floor, you know, because I'm not a fast player. I'm a slow hand kind of player, but mm -hmm. I could put together a good line. So well, I'm I'm just gonna I'm gonna step on that Leslie you know preset, and you know that that's kind of how I was making those records back then. Uh, but that record that you played on, both of those, Friendly Fire and um, Dear Life, were very acoustic records, uh, acoustic-driven albums, and that, that was a step up for me to kind of get back to that um, and, and start doing that again. So it felt like a homecoming. I'm so glad. Yeah, those parts are great. Uh, you remember Carol Merrill and those tunes, the, the, the big kind of epic right. ending on that. Well, what's funny we is... Put, we have to put that one in. Yeah. Um, the, the direction I got from the control room we were tracking, I sat down to play that kit and kind of got it tuned up and we started a roll tape and we went through a pass and um, I played it my normal thing, you know, which I'm not a light hitter and um, the cymbals were fading and I was thinking that felt pretty good and 
there was a voice in my headphones and it was whoever the engineer was on that track and he said uh uh, hey, it was uh, Chris Byron. So Chris, oh, I love that guy. Uh, I didn't. That was before I got to know him. Now I know him really well. I didn't realize that was him. Yeah, suddenly Chris is in my headphones, and he says, uh, "Hey, uh, you think it hit the drums a little harder?" <laughs> <laughs> and I sat there for a full five seconds, thinking, "Man, I thought I was hitting pretty hard." And then, like, he hit the key, the the intercom key, and I could hear everyone in the control room laughing. And apparently, I just redlined every meter in the building. Um, which is pretty hilarious to me. Um, when you do these tours with Mariah, you guys are in a van. Are you doing like living rooms or, um, I mean, that's what, um, Will Johnson mostly does living room shows now. They are living room gigs. Yeah. We, we just go in a little, little Toyota and uh, a little, we don't even use the van. It's just, you know, keyboard and two guitars. Mm -hmm. So I usually wind these interviews up with a series of eight questions, um, that I came up with that are sort of fun, uh, sometimes really heavy depending on like where someone's at when I ask them, but uh, if you're ready, we can, we can jump <laughs> oh, into that. No. no, it's good. Um, the first question is, what is the fondest memory you have of a meal that you've had in your a life? A meal? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> oh, let me see. This is going to be a, that, that's a good question. Can I come back to that one? Sure. Uh, the second <laughs> I'll question I'll have to come back to it. The, the, the problem, of course, is that the second question isn't much easier. Uh, it's uh, what is the most frightened you've ever been? <laughs> I'll go back to the first one. Okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> I I remember where we we were in Muncie, Indiana, and it was Newt and David and Travis. Travis was a drummer who's now with Sugarland. David Labrie, who's in Nashville, and, and Newt Carter. You know, God bless him. Newt, Newt was really the humor of the band. So we're sitting dry then, and that guy's sense uh, of humor very, was so very dry. dry. Yeah. So we are sitting in a Chinese restaurant. And Newt orders these, uh, you know, really hot sort of spicy foods for everybody. He, he Newt puts down the menu and, and orders for everybody. And uh, pretty soon, you know, just because of the, the use of the, the chilies and the integration of that, you know, we're – we're sweating, and and uh, and Travis is over there. Who Travis is just meat and potatoes guy at this point. I don't know if he's extended his palate anymore, or not, but everybody he can't even taste the food. It's so damn hot, and he's crying because it hurts. And Newt's over there just you know grinning from ear to ear, as is David. And I kind of picked up on the joke at that point. I'm really enjoying the food. I, I've got at that time had a bit of a cast iron stomach, not anymore. Mm -hmm. But Travis is just weeping, and at one point he's pounding his fist on the table saying. This is not fun. This is not fun. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is the drummer that gets up in the morning and eats like a whole box of Captain Crunch. That's breakfast for Travis. At least it right. was back then. Right, right. But I I got so tickled. I was just laughing so hard at his at his misery, which was mean of me to do. But at the same time, I realized that Newt kind of had this up his sleeve the whole time. <laughs> so, that, that maybe not taste wise the most enjoyable meal, but definitely the most entertaining. So. Speaking of Newt's sense of humor, uh, I got called in once late, 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 late at night to come in and, and touch up a set of drums on a session of a band that I'm not going to get into who it was. But Newt and Tom were working on something together, and um, I was uh, in there just trying to get a better sound out of the snare drum that was on the stand. And, um, you know, the bottom head was, like, flapping and, and, and needed to be tightened way up, and the snares needed to be tightened, and I was tuning the toms and... And I got it to a point where I felt like, I mean, it was took about an hour because the heads were old, but like this was one of these situations where the artist was being really persnickety about using his drums and, you know, tuning him his way. And, oh, man. And uh, I got the snare to the point where it was usable, but it, it wasn't sounding great. And I was a little frustrated with it. And, uh, and Newt and I were talking on the talk back. He's like, hit it again. And I hit it. It's going ping. And I'm like trying to find the, the lug that'll take that away. And, and, uh, the ring. Yeah. Yeah. Well, just it also, it wasn't like there's good ring and bad ring. Uh, and it had a lot of bad ring. And I finally wrestled it to a point where it was acceptable. And I was starting to get really OCD about it. And I said, Newt, I just need like five more minutes with this thing. And I think I got it. And then, you know, you hear that click in the headphones and there's a long silence. And he says, completely deadpan, I don't think it's going to affect sales. <laughs> that is so new Carter that's perfect <laughs> I was just like okay I think we're done here 
That's hilarious. So did you leave it alone? I left it after that. We got it where it what needed to be, and I bugged out of there. And um, Oh, I'm, that is hilarious. I'm a line item now on a very successful record, some invoice, like it was probably like services or something. And right. I got like 75 right. bucks to go in and tune those drums. So. That's, 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 that's a good, you, yeah, you should get something for that. That's, yeah. There's an art to that. Yeah. There's an art to that. I mean, seriously. Oh, man, I'm so OCD about drum tuning. But, yeah, that's a whole other podcast. Um. All right, so let's go back to the second question. Uh, you can also, rather, uh, you know, when I first started asking this question, what's the most frightened you've ever been? The, I got some great answers early on, and then I had a young woman come in, she's probably 27 or 28, and I asked her that question. Uh, she's a, a performer in a punk band here, and I got some side eye from her, like, how dare you ask me a question like that? And I suddenly wow. realized that it's a very different question to ask a woman, what's the most frightened you've ever been? Because it might involve being like, brutalized uh attacked or oh, yeah. injured by a man and like that's a super personal question and I, I, you know most of the time when i ask men that question it's like oh uh you know uh I, I got mugged in new york city or i was in the back of a police car or something like that um but i've come up with a substitute question as and and i offer it as an option uh what is the time you were braver than you ever thought you could be braver oh that's a good question too um that that's really good. Um, I, I can t I can answer the first one, the the scary part. Um, mm -hmm. I was I was doing a um, a plane flight from Boston to play a radio show and a festival in Annapolis, Maryland. And right as we were probably I can't remember I, I think we were coming into Annapolis, and the plane was struck by lightning, and all systems went out, and the plane started to go down. Um, and the, I thought, well, this is it. I mean, we're, we're dropping like a stone and there's no power on this plane at all. And people were, you would think people would be screaming. There was an initial sort of, you know, you know, effusiveness of people, you know, being upset and, and, but nobody, nobody shrieked. It wasn't like a horror movie and everybody got real quiet and we were sitting there in the dark and it's dropping. And I, it, you know, it seemed like it lasted, you know, a long time, like maybe, I don't know, 30 seconds. In reality, it was probably something more like 10 or 15 seconds. Lights came back on and pilot came and he said, pilot came on and said, well, we, we just got hit by, hit by lightning. We landed in Annapolis and found out that half the city didn't have any power and that it had been a violent thunderstorm rolling through. But I thought, well, this is it. And, you know, I guess my heart was in my throat for a while. I thought, well, damn, you know, I'm not ready to go yet, but I guess this happens all the time. You know, I was uh, in a car accident once where I was, ooh. I was spinning, like the car was spinning, and I wasn't afraid, which uh -huh. I didn't have time to be afraid. I was trying to get... Were you in the band or by yourself? This was with my, my wife, and um, we were coming back from Christmas at her family. I hadn't, I was not a dad yet. Um but as we were spinning and i was um because we got we got hit at about 80 miles an hour in rear quarter panel and, and we just went spinning down the freeway Good um grief. and um but one by one the people who were most precious to me you know they say your life flashes before your eyes but i actually saw these people in my mind like and i thought about how much i was going to miss them no matter what happens next if there's an afterlife if there's a heaven or, or a purgatory or or perdition or whatever all i knew is that even if there's nothing that there would be some level of awareness in my mind that i would miss my grandfather and my grandmother all oh, right and um and my family and it was uh that was my like near death moment. Uh, but I, how long ago did this happen? Well, it was um, probably two thousand and three, I would think, sixteen years ago. Um, and then you could probably recall it like it was yesterday, huh? Yeah. So I wonder when you're falling in a in a in a power uh, unpowered aircraft, which you know, despite all the best engineering in the world, without thrust, it's basically a cinder block. Um, like, what goes through your mind? I, you know, I, I don't remember. I keep, I kept thinking like, I, I remember the first thing thinking, well, I, I'm probably not going to make that radio show. I, it was something stupid, obviously, but right. I, I don't remember a whole, <laughs> a whole lot about it. I thought, well, you know, I, you know, the, my, my parents and I had been kind of, you know, somewhat estranged. They had been kind of distant, the same way with my brother and sister. Uh, what else do you expect from kind of a dysfunctional family? Mm. Uh, and I thought, well, that's, I'm not going to get a chance to build those bridges. And I remember thinking that. 
um, and that's that's about all I can recall out of it, really. Yeah. What and in, in the wake of that moment, have you been able to sort of? I guess your your parents have passed now, but was there? Yeah, there were some bridges built. You know, we walked them through the end of it, and you know, I still reach out. You know, to my my brother and sister. You know, my sister lives in New York City. She uh, she's a health instructor, and my my brother was an attorney for the NCAA, the uh, college. Uh, Do you live in Indianapolis? He lives in India. Yeah. yeah, that's where they're headquartered. That's where my wife's from. Yeah. That's how I know that. Um, oh, right. There you go. Well, yeah. he, he's getting ready to retire pretty soon, and he's had some health scares lately, so we've been able to kind of buddy up about that sort of stuff. So yeah. I'm grateful for it. But, yeah, it, it makes you savor the moments and realize that, you know, life is fragile, and, you know, like Tom Waits says, you know, it's it's brutish and mean, you know, and you yeah. you got you to gotta grab it and, 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 and not take any of it for granted. Yeah. You Man, know Jason Slayton, right? Yeah. You know, Jason's over in Birmingham. And yeah, I, yeah. I, I love his little post, you know, Georgia, his little daughter, you know, is growing up fast. Right. And, you know, he just, he's, he's, he's just such a softy, Jason is. You know, everything about him is like he just can't, you know, he's just throwing himself into being a dad and being a school teacher. He's got students. And it's like, man, what a great thing for her, his daughter, to see. But he just values all of it, just like you do with your daughter, you know. Man. This is a cool thing, you know, and... and and coming out of, at my age, coming out of a very driven world where, you know, it was all about if the if the wolf wasn't at the door, he's probably already in the basement. It's like you just get out there and, and you bootstrap it and you and you work hard and, and emotions weren't always talked about. You know, that the, the value of good friendships wasn't always the first thing on the table. And I, I think maybe we're, we're starting to get that right more and more. I see it more well, and more in younger parents. It's it's also part of the sort of the 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 genesis of this podcast was this realization that so many people I know who are professional sidemen or professional performers are just like stuffing their emotional life down as 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 deep as they can and not deal with it because it makes them less marketable as players you know right like there's right. a certain narrow range of emotions you're allowed to have as a frontman and there's an even narrower range of emotions you're allowed to have as a, as the guy who sits behind him behind a drum kit and like mm -hmm. A lot of us are not, we're not okay. Like I'm doing pretty good, but there were definitely times where things were not great and um, there was really nobody talking about it. So I thought, yeah, yeah. This is kind of, do you all think, new. Uh, Athens, do you think Nucci Space has helped with that? Or Oh my God. How many lives has Nucci Space saved? Uh, countless. I mean, I can think of three people off the top of my head whose lives uh -huh. were saved by Nucci Space. Like wow, just that's fantastic. Like sitting here. We've talked about that on the podcast a lot. I mean, yeah. They helped me. They helped uh, Boo Ray, who was uh, on episode 12. Um, uh -huh. uh, there's some people whose uh, anonymity I can't violate now who I know. No, you like, can't do that. Yeah, who, who, who haven't talked about it openly, but I know walked in there at the end of their rope and were off to rehab or off to uh, inpatient therapy like within 48 hours, which is yeah, a testament yeah. to the effectiveness and the, and the like just – like pure dedication to mission that Nucci Space has. Glad to hear that because I haven't kept up with the with the comings and goings of Nucci's, but I'm glad that's there. I haven't seen anything like that actually replicated in any of the other cities. When Mariah and I were first married, we were on the road all the time, mm -hmm. and I never heard of counseling centers that were specifically geared toward artistic people. I just it's happening. There's the Sims Foundation in Austin, and there's also one called uh, Ham H A A M in Austin. And then uh, Nashville has Music Cares. You can walk into Music Cares or email them and, and, and get help. Uh, this, yes. it's, it's, yeah, this is, I was aware of that one, yep. Yeah, it's happening, and, it, and it's helping a lot of people. I'm super stoked about it. Well, like you mentioned earlier, Patrick, you know, with, you know, musicians falling through the cracks of, of uh, you know, medical care, um, it's, you know, you, you, what do you do, you know, when you've literally re reached the end of the rope and there's no, there's no safety net, what do you do? And then you go to, like, the municipal services, which are starved for resources, and you're like, man, I'm having anxiety attacks, I think I might kill myself, and they're like, okay, well, uh, we can get you in to see a doctor in six months. Yeah. It's like... No, I, I, hear, I hear it a lot. In six months, I will be dust. You know, yeah, I, I will be a memory of dust if we don't do yeah. something soon. So, yeah. Um, the third question is, what is the thing in your life that you've lost that you regret losing the most? Oh, wow. That's a good one, too. Let's see. I, I, think, I, I think I regret losing both of my parents They're so close together because they were they, – they, the relationship had kind of devolved between them. But there were these little glimmers that maybe things might – 
you know, improve. Uh, my dad died of alcohol-related issues, and my mom was severely depressed. But I, I loved being near them, and I loved, you know, their input. I, I wish they had lived a little bit longer to come out here to New Mexico and, and get a different taste of things. I, I regret not, and I did get to say things to them, you know, before they expired that I wanted to say. Mom's death was actually pretty quick. Um, it, it came somewhat unexpected. Uh, Dad's was a little bit more, you know, slower. Actually, honestly, Mom went first, and to tell you the truth, I think I think Dad kind of engineered the demise, um, you know, of like, I'm catching up with Mary. That's what I'm going to do here. Yeah. Well, uh, tell me about a time you received an act of kindness from a stranger. Oh wow, that's been so many. There, there have been fans that have reached out when things were, you know, really bottoming out. Um, I, they, they ended up running a Kickstarter program because of this emergency surgery last year, and that's really, if you want something super tangible, you know, it, it's a little humiliating in some ways. It's like I don't want to be the recipient of charity, but by golly, I needed it. I needed it hard, and it was rough. And we still wound up having ridiculous hospital bills um, that we're still paying on. But there was such a galvanization of kindness and goodwill. And, and you know, when I mean, people can, you know, toss in money, but they can also send messages. And the messages were just myriad in uh, in number. And I just thought, oh, God, this is so good for me to hear. That was actually, in some ways, is just as good a medicine as being able to, you know, pay for some of the surgeries. So. And that happened just recently. That was last year, Patrick. So. Yeah. I mean, when you live in a for-profit health care system, and there's no social safety net, then it's not so much charity as self-defense that yeah. we take yeah, care of each go. other. Because today it's you, tomorrow it might be me. And like if I can throw 25, 30 bucks and a GoFundMe for someone I know who is, is going to uh, potentially suffer for the rest of their life, and that may be really short, or they can go see a doctor... Um, I mean, to me, that's just an investment in the community that we live in. It's just like it, it, it's it's self-defense, you know, um, because yeah. there's no system to protect us. So we have to protect each other. Yeah, and, and yeah, absolutely. Hands down, I, I, I met a GoFundMe uh, project uh, that was that was, you know, for me, it, it was it was wonderful. I, I think hearing people's goodwill verbalized and at the same time, people saying, hey, you know, like you just said, that that could be me. We're all in this together. You yeah, know? man. And, and I thought, well, yeah, that's true. I I, I want to be able to you know chip back in to, you know, help folks out. The the first the first thing that came up on the boards a few months ago was Jeff. You know, and I thought, well, here we go. We're we're going to get into this because I knew Jeff and I knew Phyllis and, you know, all the people that he knew. And I started reading down the line of contributors. It's like, there you go. I I hope right. at least that brought a measure of joy, and satisfaction. Your life, because so, so many times, you know, in one of the things that modernity has done is it. It's, it's kind of stripped us of direct contact from each other, you know, with devices and, and all this stuff, and it's made us polarized from each other. But there you go. You get to hear people's goodwill. Your music meant so much to me. Your, you know, your, your playing, your stage presence, your kindness, your encouragement. You know, I can check off on every single one of those when I ran into Jeff, usually at the taco stand in most places. Right. Um, he was up there either seeing Kurt or Manfred would be up there, you know, so we, right. would, we would talk. So anyway, he was great. So... What what's your favorite place to gig? Oh, you know that's a good question. I'd I'd say that the the gigs that we played over the years at Eddie's uh, at the Attic in Atlanta were were pretty memorable. Um, the place in Chicago called Shuba's was also memorable. We sold that place out numerous times. Um, yeah, those two places. If I could get two choices, I'd say they were the greatest. You know, uh, sometimes it breaks out into like, what's your favorite place in the U.S. and what's your favorite place in other countries, but. Um, I feel like yeah. In, in in London, we like playing the Mean Fiddler, which was a, a great place. I never played there. There was a c club called the Luminaire that I I talk about a lot on this show because they had signs up that say uh, this is a music. Is that venue. in London? Yeah, it's in London. It's closed now. Uh, there was it was it was in this weird spot between two tube stations, so it was hard to get to, and that really hurt it. But there were signs up that said this is a music venue. If you'd like to have a conversation, we invite you to try our bar downstairs. Oh, cool. So, and if you were like yip yapping while somebody was playing, uh, uh, a very polite but firm gentleman would come out and tap you on the shoulder and say, there is a bar downstairs. You know? Nice. Like, and That's I just great. loved that place. 
Very cool. The Lumineer. I, I never heard of it. Sorry. Yeah, it didn't. I don't. I think it was, uh, you know, one of those candle that burns twice as bright, burns half as long kind of venues. But um, right, right. So visa and income considerations aside, if you could live anywhere in the world, where would you live? Uh, Mariah wants to live in New Zealand, and I'm okay with that. We, we've actually thought about, you know, finding a place to go to in the in the um, in, under the climate that we seem to be under and heading toward. And uh, you know, because fascism is a it's it's a weird thing the way it shows up. You know, you look back through history. I mean, you and I could talk for hours and hours about this, and you wonder, well, there's where it got started, and there's where it was galvanized, and there were the mouthpieces and the spokespersons, right. and there were the sycophants and the minions who came in on board. And uh, I'm out of here. Yeah, you're undergraduates yeah, in history, just like mine. Yeah, there you go. That's right. That's right. You yeah. are a history major. Well, there you go. It's like where where, could, where would I like to renounce my citizenship from? I'll, I'll take I'll take New Zealand. Right, right. Do you fish? I don't. Do you? Man, yeah, yeah. I love fly fishing. And oh, uh, good deal. So places, where would you go? Uh, well, if I could live anywhere, it would be in the southern part of Spain or the northern part of Spain for two different reasons. But. Um, We'll get into oh, that. The cuisine would be incredible. Yeah. Well, there's whole towns that were abandoned in northern Spain but because of what's happening here, which is an increased concentration of wealth and prosperity in urban centers and the sort of uh, neglect of, of rural communities. And so, like, there are places, there'll be a town with, you know, 10 or 12 buildings and a town oven where they used to bake all the bread for the town. And, um, you know, fields all around for growing uh, food and, and olive trees uh, that are, you know, 300 years Ooh, old. That already sounds good. This is northern Spain. Northern Spain. You can buy the whole damn town for half a million dollars or it's sometimes oh as low God. as a quarter million dollars. And there's like a real estate agency. Uh, I may just be blowing like I may have just blown the secret, but there's a real estate agency that has a Facebook page like, you know, buy a town in northern Spain. Um, and, you know, I was Whoa. thinking like and the you know, the fly fishing looks good enough. You could sell. Like, you know, three day fly fishing weekends to wealthy English guys and probably keep the whole thing going. But, um, <laughs> yeah. Um, and Ireland's, Ireland's right up the road, really. I mean, yeah. it's not that far. No, I mean, there you go. That sounds fantastic. Yeah. Uh, some friends of mine from Chattanooga and I just, when we get together, once we've had a few cups of coffee and it starts to get late at night, that subject right. always comes up. Like, so Spain, so, you know. You would ask me about the Milagro Wars. So uh, a river runs through it. Is, is that is that your uh, Bible for you? You know, that's a really good book. Um, but um, there was a whole group. There's a whole bunch of like trout fishing literature from that part of the 20th century. Um, and there was a, a, a writer named Robert Travers who uh, was an avid fly fisherman and wrote a bunch of books. But he also wrote Anatomy of a Murder, uh, and it's actually in the film with Jimmy Stewart uh, and. Um, uh, I can't remember the exact one of his books, but there was one I thought, this is the perfect fishing book. I love this book. And uh, I'll, nice. put a, I'll put a link to it in the show notes. But um, Yeah, yeah, you, know, you should throw it at me. That'd be great. Yeah. Um, so this is a particularly tricky question because we talked this whole conversation about having to sell instruments that you loved. But do you have a perfect musical instrument, and uh, do you still own it? I have sold everything except one instrument that I held on to for years, and I got it. It's a, it's a 1969 Gibson uh, J50 that's been basically retooled by, uh, by Bill Glazer's um, people there in Nashville. I bought it when Kenny and I were making uh, with, with the band. <clears throat> Kenny and I went out one day and just went guitar shopping. And the, the label had given us a bit of an advance. I bought this 1969 uh, uh, Gibson J50, but that's when it had the two pneumatic bridges with the metal saddle. So Bill Glazer put, a, you know, a wooden, um, you know, bridge on it, mm -hmm. and it, I've had it forever. It's beat to hell. Delta Airlines crushed it one time. Oh. I duct taped it, duct taped it for a British tour. Honest to God, the top was coming off of it. Um, it's been re-glued, but I love it. I love the way it feels. It has that chunky baseball bat, you know, neck. Mm -hmm. That's why I like, you know, the Gibsons. But the other guitar right behind it I bought there in Athens, um, and it's a 1947 Gibson ES-125 that Van Shepard sold me. It was his dad's guitar, mm -hmm. um, and his, his dad plays it. It is a beautiful—I I feel like I'm standing on the shoulder of giants every time I pick it up, Patrick. I might mm -hmm. even get a little uh, wistful here about this little uh, little weepy-eyed— it is such a beautiful sounding instrument. It's very plinky sounding. Doesn't have a lot of resonance in the body, but I love it because it conjures the dust bowl stuff immediately oh, yeah. when you pick it up. P totally playable, and I, I love that guitar. So it doesn't leave home very much. But the J50 is the workhorse guitar on the road. So the Gibson that came from Nashville, did you buy it at Gruen or somewhere else? 
I did buy it at Groons. I sure did. Yeah, that's a great shop. Like, I'm yeah, so used to it, walking it, into the, the overtly hostile guitar shop that when you walk into Groon and they're like, hey, you don't have to buy anything while you're here. You can play any one of these guitars and we'll give you a coffee mug if you need one. Like, I, I just can't. That exa- that's exactly how they are. I can't believe how kind they are. It's like a guitar petting zoo. Like, you can just go in and pet the guitars. and. Uh, <laughs> well, they don't have a lot of new stuff. So, they, you know, if it's got another ding on it, who's going to know, right? I mean, right. they're funny. And they, they jack those guitars like there's no space between. There's not even half an inch between those guitars on the wall. No, they're in there tight. they got a new location. They're not downtown anymore. I don't know if you've been there recently. It's oh, little, I have not been there. It's a little no. more open and airy and kind of sunny and... Man, the guys there are just super kind. And I, last time I was in there, I played a um, 74 P bass that wasn't factory original. So it was like a, a relatively affordable 2500 bucks, And it was just the greatest bass yeah. I've ever played. And I sent a picture of it to my wife saying, how divorced would we be if I bought a $2,500 bass today? <laughs> and she was like, uh, the answer I got was the, are you fucking kidding me divorced is how divorced we would be. <laughs> so <laughs> I did not buy that bass. Yeah. But I love that store, man. Well, at least you know what the boundaries are. You yeah, know what you're doing. Right. We're so, we're so broke right now. I'm not I'm sure you know what I'm talking about, but yeah, podcasting ain't paying the bills. Um but uh The bright, bright side is at least I had the instruments there to sell to begin with. Right. You know, it's like you know I mean and I hate being a whiner and I, I realize that I, I'm I'm a brat in a lot of ways and so you know, I, I parted with a nineties telly that I had I remember that I had a really black one. The black one, yeah, yeah. it's gone. The, the Rickenbacker is gone. The George Harrison Rick that I got in Minneapolis shortly after uh, George died, actually. Mm-hmm. And I had, I had thought, well, I, I'm I'm going to grab this guitar. It's just actually the pickups in those uh, George Harrison in those um, the uh, tw- it was a George Harrison twelve string, but I always played it as a six just because the neck was a little bit wider. Um, but that you know I had to part with that. But you know at least they were there to sell, get us over the hump for a couple of months. I I, I can't complain. I mean, as I was shoving a set of stainless steel Ludwig's that I bought on a whim uh, uh-huh. into boxes to pay for a stove because our stove died, um, I was lamenting it to my wife like I really liked these drums. They were the loudest drums I ever played. Uh, and I, I bet was, I was sending them to New Mexico, uh, coincidentally enough, and. Um, she said, "Babe, Ludwig's still making great drums," and she's right, yeah. man. They just keep turning out good stuff. So push comes yeah, to shove, do. I'll just go find another stainless kit. You know, you you've played Ludwig's all your life, haven't you? Yep, mostly. I yeah. uh, had a Gretsch period in the '90s for a while, and I had you know when we met, I was playing that Slingerland Radio King kit that I picked up uh, in Cleveland for two hundred bucks. Um, Yes, I remember that. White yeah. Pearl, super, super mint. I sold that a couple Do you still times. have that? No, I sold it for exactly yeah. the reasons we're talking about. Like I had to yeah, make I some money it. fast, you know? Yeah. Um, that was about adoption expenses, you know? Had to make some um, money to pay lawyers and stuff. So. Oh, man, worth every penny. Good Oh, great. yeah, I don't. I, I, I never think about that kit except when I see pictures of it. I'm like, oh, yeah, I enjoyed those drums. But, you know, I got that Thermogloss kit now that just crushes the sound of every other drum set I've ever owned. So. Yeah, they, they, they is that is that the kit that where they kind of retooled the the edges on it or something? There's a, there's some kind of snugger fit with the head, isn't there? Everything about those drums is a departure from the years just prior. They're still three ply, but '60s were mahogany, poplar, mahogany or mahogany poplar maple, depending on what they had on hand. Uh-huh. And the reason all those drums are painted white on the inside is because. You know, they just never knew what they were going to have on hand. After Ringo and the Beatles appeared on Ed Sullivan, uh, Ludwig's factory ran seven months behind for seven years, and they were running three shifts. And so they were just... Wow, because everybody wanted that. Kid. Everybody wanted Ludwig's because Ringo played Ludwig's, and so they were making drums as fast as they could, and sometimes the interply was maple, and sometimes it was mahogany. And uh, I doubt it was ever poplar because that's a really soft wood, but they would just paint them white so they would all match and push them out the door, you know. Um, yeah. And then as things That's what I had on my kit. It was a Ludwig Gold Sparkle set, and it, yeah. it, it had the white on the inside. Right. So in the early or late, like late, late 60s, they experimented with a maple poplar, maple three ply, still had the reinforcement rings because the shells are so thin, they had to stiffen them at the edges. Um, and then they did the lightest coating of lacquer. Of, they would heat the lacquer, which is why they call it thermogloss, and it would turn this lovely amber color, and it was nitrocellulose lacquer, and it was the thinnest finish they ever put on a set of drums. And the edges were a tiny bit sharper than they had been previously. They used to be sort of baseball battish, and now they were sharper. And I I got a set of those a couple of years ago, 
and I sent the toms out to Chris Hewer in California, and he redid the edges uh, to where they were perfect, perfect bearing edges. And that kit oh. sounds like no other kit I've ever owned. And but I was touring. They're really live sounding, I bet. Mean, yeah. Oh yeah, they're just clear and boomy and perfect. But I was like lying in hotel room beds, getting up three or four times a night and looking out the curtains at the trailer because I was terrified that kit was going to get stolen. So, oh, I bet. So absolutely. I've, yeah, it's like your Gibson that doesn't leave the house. Like that kit kind of just goes to sessions in the studio and Athens gigs. But I put together a, a bunch of orphan shells off of Craigslist and Facebook Marketplace and wrapped them in gold sparkle. So my touring kit now is a gold sparkle three ply Ludwig kit with like a one seventy shell and one mid sixties and one late. It's all mismatched. Nice, they sound man. Great that's together. elegant. That is elegant, yeah. and that's such the great retro touch. That's perfect. Gold sparkle, man. It's where it's at. Like. <laughs> <laughs> it's my <laughs> second favorite finish of all time. Um, What's your first? Oh, that thermogloss maple. The thermogloss. It just, it's thin, and so it gets little, little like imperfections and dents in it, and little chips where it flakes off on the on the wood underneath shows. And something about that just says it's elegant, and it 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 reflects the fact that I've spent the last thirty years of my life as a working musician, and and like I, those hey, drums look, are. Ask you this, and, and somebody ought to be interviewing you. Do, do you have an endorsement deal with anybody? It seems like you could get one. Istanbul Symbols, Istanbul Agap is my one endorsement, and they make the most beautiful Turkish dark symbols that are so expressive, and they record well, and they're durable. Uh -huh. and, I mean, they're just great, and they make big symbols. Like you can get a twenty-four inch crash if you need one, you know, and that's Ooh, a lovely. And oh so, yeah, I bet that rings forever. Well, it's it, but it gets out of the way. It's got a real dark initial attack, and it shimmers for a second, and then it's gone. And then it vanishes. Yeah, yeah. it's perfect. Well, that's great. Yeah. Um, yeah, it seems like you could. It seems like you could have a kid endorsement, but I, I don't know how any of this well, works. Or, I, you know, partial endorsement or whatever. Yeah, I've thought about it. Like, but like, the, really, the only thing I would need from Ludwig is logo heads to put on my kids. You know, like, yeah. you know, a, a, a drum head for the kick drum that says Ludwig. So. Because those are expensive yeah. and you got to get them shipped because nobody carries them locally. And that's really the only, like, I've got, like, I mean, an embarrassing number of drum kits in the garage right now because I pick them up cheap on tour and just bring them home. Right, right. And fix them up, you know. All right, last that's question great. of the eight questions. Um, okay. If you could imagine a taxi uh, that's not constrained by time or space, um, you can go anywhere. Um, and you got into this taxi and you said to the driver, hey, man, take me home. Where's that taxi going to take you? <laughs> man, you rule. These questions are great. <laughs> oh, my good. I wish you'd sent them ahead of time so I could have perused it. So this is going to be, um, man, you know what? I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. I wish that I would, had become a competent jazz drummer and I wish I lived in New York City in the 50s, right before Miles came on and made Kind of Blue. I wish that I was going to Minton's. Um, and I can't remember. Was the Savoy in New York or Chicago? I Savoy remember. was I New York, Minton's stomping at the Savoy. That was uh, where the first trap kit was uh, played. Uh, was uh, There you go. I uh, want to be that guy yeah. in that circle. What was that guy's I want to be that guy. Chip What's Web? That? Chip Web? Chick Web. Chick Web was... Uh, Chick uh, Web, yeah. yeah. Philly Joe Jones, all yeah. of those guys. Sick, yeah. just fantastic stuff. Um, and those drums sounded amazing. About... Oh, God, no kidding. The way they tuned them. I mean, that's the way, like, I, the way I tune my kick drum is pure Joe Morello. Like, I... This is embarrassing how nerdy this is, but I went through video after video of the Brubeck band looking for any indication of how... Um, he tuned it, yeah. yeah right. Or what heads he was using, and like, uh -huh. did you find what'd you find out? So, I've seen a lot of those same videos. So yeah, Ludwig uh, medium or me, or heavy resonant head with a felt strip, and then uh, Emperor felt batter strip, yeah. with a felt strip and a moleskin patch, like the moleskin that you put over a blister in your shoe that you can buy, like the Doctor Scholl sticky. Moleskin he put patch. that on the edge of the snare. He, yeah, and he put that where the the, the beater ball from the uh, kick drum pedal hit the head to, oh, that's right. yeah, to yeah, kill yeah. some of the click. And then the other thing I discovered was a lot of those guys, even as late as the uh, mid-60s, were still using calfskin batter heads on their snare, including Roger Hawkins at Muscle Shoals. 
he was uh, a Caskin guy. And as soon as I, I, I'm not actually familiar with that drummer, so I, I'm I'm gonna um, indulge my ignorance then. So yeah, a ca- I, the first kid I got. Remember that Slingerland kid mm-hmm. that I told you I had? Yeah. All Caskin heads. Yeah, I didn't yeah. know what they were. They were so warm and, and rigged. Does anybody make those anymore? Well, you can buy modern caskins with a metal flesh hoop. Flesh hoop is what they wrap it around. Like they put the heads on wet, and then as they dry out, they tighten, and they sort of fold a little seam over, and it pulls against uh-huh. itself, and it tucks itself in. Um, and uh, the American Tanneries was the name of the company that made the heads for a bunch of those companies. I think it was they made Ludwig's and Gretsch heads for them, for the caskins no for them. Kidding. And I think that Slingerland had its own, like, caskin thing going or or maybe it was Ludwig, yeah. but oh, it's Ludwig that had its own because if you look at the Muscle Shoals movie uh, about the rhythm section of Muscle Shoals, and it's embarrassing how much time I spent on this too. Eventually, you s- you'll see Roger Hawkins playing a five-inch Ludwig Superphonic, the most recorded snare in history, and you can see the cow outline because the Ludwig head had a stamp, an ink stamp, and it <laughs> it was the shape of a cow, and it said Ludwig White Calf inside that stamp. I. I- yeah, I remember those little logos. The the floor tom that I had was 18 inches instead of the normal 16. Ooh. It was massive. So it was like I guess it was like when Buddy Buddy Rich's kit. I guess he had a 16 and an 18, or maybe he had an 18 and a 20. No, no he, was, he had two 16s, and he would use the second one as a drink stand and a towel stand. <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> oh my god! Mitch Mitchell was the guy who was like, I I need an 18 inch floor tom, and and then of course once Ginger Baker saw that he needed one too, so right. Yeah. Right. I love that story about uh, Paige and and, uh, and and Plan and Bonham because he wanted the double Ludwig kit, the, the double Vista light, but they took the bass drum and hit it. Hit it, they? yeah. That's they hit it from him. Yeah, that's hilarious. <laughs> so it all comes in. So, well, this is it. That's all we got. Right. Yeah. Wasn't there supposed to be another kick drum? Nope, never saw one. Nope, just one. <laughs> <laughs> My God, those are great stories. Yeah, that's where I would go. I would go back to Minton's in New York City and just hang around and yeah. just watch the magic, watch it all. Man, have you seen the the Ken? Um, uh, what's the documentary's name? Who did the Vietnam and the yeah, Ken um, Burns, yeah, the Ken Burns documentary on jazz where he, I sure have. He talks about um, uh, the bass player. Ken Burns Ord- is a national treasure, man. Oh, between yeah. that and his National Park series, it's incredible. So he, there's a story like the um, uh, the bass player uh, Hayden. Um, uh, Charlie, Charlie Hayden. Yeah, Charlie Hayden is playing upright at the Village Vanguard. I think it was uh, at the debut of the Shape of Jazz to come because they were out west, right? So they come to New York for their big debut, and he's playing. And some lunatic comes out of the crowd and puts his ear against the f hole on Charlie's bass. Oh, no. I've seen him tell this. He told a story in that, and I've, I've seen another interview where he tells this story. And he's like playing bass along with the rest of the Ornette Coleman Quartet, and he keeps looking at the door guys like, "Get this guy out of here." And they're just pretending they don't see him. They're like hands in pockets, like looking everywhere but at this dude. And finally, like the song ends and Ken, and, and Charlie uh, looks down and the guy's gone. And after the set, he goes to the door guys and he's like, um, wh- why didn't you guys come get that crazy guy who came up on stage? And they're like, uh, that was Leonard Bernstein? No. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that is awesome. Yeah. I, I thought you were going to tell me it was Thelonious Monk, but that Bernstein made, is even... Yeah. More outrageous. Yeah, it would have made just as much sense, I think. Well, man, That's this has been awesome. great. I really appreciate you taking the time to do it. Um, oh, it, it, this has been a joy. Thanks a lot. Yeah, but um, please. But we uh, need to put together. We need to put together a band and and go to play Ireland. That's where we need to do. And then we'll just drop into northern Spain and check out some of the real estate. This could work. Man, thanks for doing this. I'll, I'm deeply grateful. Um, I'll, I'll I'll keep saying prayers that the that financial ref, uh, you know finances reverse and and you get in the the plus column like hard and fast. Actually, things are going really well right now. Um, I mean, I, I joke that the podcast isn't paying the bills, but it it pays for itself and it it things are picking up. I won this grant from this um, Swedish company that was doing a. Big I saw m- that. Yeah, congratulations. Yeah, that's going to pay for some new microphones and a few other things. So it's good. I will send you those songs, and uh, we'll go from there. Great. Thanks so much, Bill. God God bless you. You are an amazing person. Thanks so much. Thanks, man. You too. See ya. All right. Bye. All right. That's our interview with Bill Maloney. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks, Bill, for doing that. Hey, if you're struggling with dark thoughts, if you're contemplating self-harm, if you need someone to talk to, the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline is 24-7. It's free. It's confidential. It's staffed by trained volunteers to help you through your crisis. one 800 
1-800-273-8255. That's 1-800-273-8255. That's a free phone call from any phone in the United States. If you're a trans person and you're struggling with anxiety or depression or dysphoria, you need to talk to a peer. The Trans Lifelines Peer Support Line is one 877 Five six five eight eight six zero. That's one eight seven seven five six five eight eight six zero. Stay tuned here. Keep an eye out for announcements about our upcoming website and our upcoming live episode that's going to be taped at Hendershots here in Athens, Georgia. If you're here in Athens, Georgia, where we record our program and you need to talk to someone, you can always go to Nucci Space. If you're a musician, they provide free mental health referrals and counseling to musicians in the Athens or greater Athens area. That's Nucci Space in Athens, Georgia. Go to NUCI.org. In the meantime, be kind to yourself. Take care of yourself. Support live music, go see your favorite band, and remember, loud guitars save lives.